Mr. President, thanks again for the delay. Um, we have uh, fixed the problem and we are now live. Thank you. I will give an abbreviated intro uh, to members of the public. Uh, welcome to this public meeting of the State Board of Education. Uh, it is December 15th, 2021. Uh, we apologize for uh, the tech issues that we're experiencing. Um, very briefly tonight, we will have a panel of uh, practice and research experts who will help us better understand and address the challenges that our teacher workforce is facing. The State Board has been doing work in this area for many years. Um, and tonight we're hoping that we glean some insights that will help uh, inform future solutions. Uh, we'll also be considering a number of ceremonial uh, resolutions um, and extending the work of our board governance committee. Um, and importantly to note, um, our, we wanted to update the public on extending the timeline of our social studies standards revision process. Um, the, the work continues, uh, but due to a number of factors, the State Board and OSSE have determined that the original timeline for public review uh, should be moved to the spring um, of 2022. Um, and that would allow us to uh, create even stronger standards uh, and continue within the process. Uh, wanted to thank OSSE for their partnership and also give kudos to Representative Sutter for helping lead the board's work there. Um, and uh, we will now turn it over to uh, Superintendent Grant for her opening remarks. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, President Parker. I'm going to try to reiterate my tremendous thanks to all of the members of the board for their support. Uh, it is humbling and exciting to finally be your state superintendent. Um, and I, my original remarks, it's been great to receive your support. It's also been important to receive your challenge for the service uh, and partnership that you expect from your state education agency. And I really do look forward to leading with all of you. Thank you in advance to those who have started to join me on school visits. And I know some of you are realigning your calendar to make that possible. I'm also working to make sure that I have more face time with you all in the coming weeks and months. And so again, uh, this has been a journey uh, and just thank you for being true partners in the journey. Um, I wanted to take a couple of moments this afternoon to give you updates on our work at OSSE, spend some time walking through some of our next steps around the joint work we do with you all, and actually talk deeply about the social studies standards. I should note that I was a social studies teacher, and so part of the reason we arrive at where we are is my insistence in making sure that the standards are up quality and right shape because it is the content area that is near and dear to my heart. The past few weeks have been really busy for OSSE. Uh, we released the latest version of the DC report card and I hope you had an opportunity to look at it. It includes data from the 2020-21 school year, data on attendance, discipline, program offerings, graduation rates, and more. We hope that it's useful and informative to the board's work but also helpful to your constituents as they seek information about our public schools in the district. I think it's important to note that we redesigned the report card and we brought that work internal to OSSE. And so it's been a huge lift to make sure that we completed it. Uh, and we're really proud of that work. Last weekend, I hope you know, we held our annual EdFest. Uh, it's brought to you by My School DC. And as you know, EdFest is the district's annual public school fair. Families can meet with school representatives from over 200 DCPS and public charter schools. And we are pleased to tell you that about 1,800 virtual attendees attended. That's up by several hundred from last year. As a quick reminder, my School DC lottery application opened on December 13th, 2021. This application is the common application and common lottery for the district's public school options. The deadline for completing the application is February 1st, 2022 for students in grades nine through 12. And the deadline for completing the application is May, March 1st, my apologies, 2022 for students in grades pre-K three through eight. Additional information can be found at www.myschooldc.org. I am looking forward to tomorrow's hearing in the Council on Teacher and Principal Retention. I will appear before the Council to provide testimony and to answer their questions. Our teachers and school leaders have been nothing short of heroic throughout this pandemic, and we will not be able to shift from recovery toward restoration after this pandemic without a special focus on ensuring the well-being of our educators. 
In my testimony tomorrow, I will share the work that Asi has taken to ensure access to data on the educator workforce, and I will share some early statewide data on the educator workforce in the district ahead of a suite of products coming early next year. I will also highlight steps that Asi has taken to support educator well-being and effectiveness. I know that teacher retention data is a place of special focus for this board, and we are really pleased to be making strides on delivering this data to all of you. I'm eager to hear from your panel of distinguished witnesses this evening on teacher wellness. Even though I'm not on the platform, I'm always attending the full meeting. This is a timely topic, and I'm really glad to see your leadership on this topic. I'm also glad that the board will honor our 2022 DC Teacher of the Year, Ms. Dominique Foster, a pre-K teacher at Friendship Public Charter School, Low Pierce Elementary Campus. Back in October, I was honored to surprise Ms. Foster with this award with Mayor Bowser. Throughout the COVID-19 public health emergency, Ms. Foster provided a high level of instruction and robust educational experiences during distance learning. When field trips weren't available, she brought the community to her virtual classroom, inviting special guests to share their lives and experiences with young learners. Her classroom is truly a masterpiece, and I really hope you have a chance to go visit. Her work is beyond the call of duty. She is a true exemplar to the profession and the excellence right here in the District of Columbia. I just could not be more excited about, about her. Asi has been working with the State Board of Education and its Social Studies Advisory Committee to revise our statewide social studies standards. And as I said earlier, this is critically important work. We wanna ensure that our statewide social studies standards are rigorous and inclusive of the rich diversity of the district and our proud history. Over the past several months, the advisory committee has provided ASI with guiding principles to use for revising the standards. Our technical writing committee, led by educators, have worked hard on draft standards. I'm proud of the trajectory of the work and the partnership that ASI has had with board member Jessica Sutter. Our initial timeline for public engagement on the draft of standards was set to kick off this December and carry on through mid-January. Unfortunately, due to the need to take a deeper look at the elementary school standards that we've drafted, we are delaying kickoff in public engagement. I take responsibility for that, but I wanna make sure that the public's first look at the standards reflect our best thinking and are of sufficient quality to really reflect all of the hard work that both ASI and the board have taken to date on this project. This doesn't mean that I'm not committed to the work, it actually means that I care deeply about both timelines, but more importantly, quality, and I won't exchange one for the other. Allow me to outline the timeline that my team has worked on with board member Sutter. Asi will continue to revise and improve standards and prepare for public engagement in February. We will begin public engagement in March, along with working on a timeline for a full multi-year implementation of the standards once they are completed. This puts us in a place where we will have final standards completed by June with an anticipated vote by the board in July. Let me assure you, this is still a very aggressive timeline for a scope of work as massive as our social studies standards, and we look forward to moving forward. Finally, as 2021 ends, and I cannot believe that this year is ending in two weeks, I wanted to end how I started. I'm truly honored to be your state superintendent, and I'm really privileged to work beside each of you. This year has been full of twists and turns, seen and unseen, and I hope that everyone has a hope-filled and holiday season full of joy, no matter how you choose to celebrate. I hope that you will rest and surround yourself with love and loved ones. I also hope you take time to reflect and help someone in our community who is less fortunate. As you all know, the needs are great in our community, and I hope you will share some kindness too. As we look to a new calendar year, I know that we've all been through a lot. We've been working a long war with a really stubborn microscopic enemy that none of us asked for, and getting on the other side of this pandemic will continue to require our best efforts to civilly and inclusively collaborate and cooperate. 
it is my distinct honor to be your state superintendent. And before I close, in the spirit of a room of educators, I do want to lift up the life and work of Bell Hooks, her literature, her research, all that she served as a Black woman in this space has changed my life and has changed the lives of many. And so as you are picking up books to read into the new year, please consider turning to her literature. Um, It's been a distinct honor and joy to speak with you all this evening, and I'm looking forward to your meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Um, And ditto on everything about um, Bill Hooks, uh, but also the partnership between ASI and the State Board. uh, For members of the public, there are many uh, examples this year of where we have productively collaborated. Social studies is one. Uh, I think thing. I just, can I address Representative Reed's question that she dropped in the chat? Uh, yes. Uh, do you mind reading or paraphrasing it for public? That but I know a point raised by Representative Sutter was getting teachers acclimated to the standards in time for the start of the school year. Does July give adequate time or would it be anticipated delaying implementation one school year later? So it's a really great question. It's one that I framed in taking into the position. We have to create a multi-year time frame for implementation. So we will be seeking to endeavor approval of standards in July, and then we will be rolling out to you all in public in collaboration, who, how we will implement those standards to ensure that pre-K three through 12, teachers and LEAs have the opportunity to make sure that they have units of study and content in alignment with the standards. Sorry, I know that that's not general practice, but I didn't wanna leave Representative Reed's question unaddressed because I leave this platform and wouldn't have an opportunity to respond. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, And we are with that going to move forward. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Grant, for sharing with us. Uh, Members, we are going to move towards our panel discussion tonight, uh, which will focus on teacher wellness. Uh, We know that teachers are one of the most significant factors uh, impacting student success uh, in schools. We also know that our educators who uh, are currently feeling undersupported um, and that those who feel unsupported are more likely to leave the profession, especially early in their careers. Uh, The district must do more uh, to support our teachers in their profession, to permit them to thrive uh, and bring their expertise and joy uh, to bear. Uh, or we will never close the opportunity and ac- academic gaps that exist in our uh, schools. Uh, tonight's panel brings together a wide range of expertise grounded in practice and research. Uh, Tina Bradshaw Smith is a teacher at uh, Wilson High School, uh, or now dubbed Jackson Reed High School, uh, a WTU teacher leader and has research exp- experience in teacher wellness. Uh, Kennard Branch is the principal of Garfield uh, Inquiry based Preparatory Academy, and he is joined uh, by, G- by Jolene uh, Mathias, an ELA instructional coach at Garfield. Uh, Dr. Olga Price is the director of the Center for Health and Healthcare in Schools uh, at the Milken Institute School of Public Health uh, at George Washington University. Uh, we also have Johanna Olseth, uh, who is the family engagement and wellness manager at Bria Public Charter School. Uh, and Gina Fornell, uh, who is the Director of Teaching and Learning at the Center for Inspired Teaching. Um, for those of you on our panel, you will each have up to five minutes uh, for your presentation tonight. Uh, after each of you speak, uh, we will have rounds of questions from members of the State Board. Um, and if you set your view to gallery mode uh, on the Zoom panel, you will be able to see the timer uh, as a helpful reminder. So with that, uh, Ms. Bradshaw Smith, we will begin with you and you may start whenever you're ready. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Parker. How are you? I'm doing great. Wonderful. And I see everyone here. I just love to see faces. I wish we were in person. Again, my name is Tina Bradshaw Smith. I am a veteran teacher uh, at Wilson Senior High School. I did um, participate in the Teachers and Leaders Program with, through the WTU. My um, research project, because my background is health and physical education, uh, my research project started out as, I wonder how teachers are feeling. That was my first question. And it ended up becoming um, act or react. Uh, how do teachers cope with stressful 
situations during the pandemic. Uh, what I found out that over the years, uh, learning how to cope with ACEs, which are adverse childhood, childhood excuse me, experiences, um, that's become a norm for most of us. But in unprecedented times such as these, we have been in a pandemic for the past 400 plus days. Uh, teachers are experiencing even more trauma than we could ever imagine. I examine how teachers are coping with the new stresses of the day, um, such as day-to-day -day life with their own families, virtual teaching because, and uh, again, I did this last year, which is very, very relevant to this year. Um, virtual teaching, in-person learning, and as well as their own family dynamics. How do people handle that? Understand, I found out teacher burnout is a serious psychological um, condition that affects the lives of thousands of highly effective teachers throughout the United States. We are finding that more teachers are leaving the profession right now. Right now, as we speak, there are people that are walking off the job because they cannot deal with what's going on. They're not allowed to deal with it. Some of the reasons, overload, overload from administration, overload from students, overload from parents. Uh, we have, we, <clears throat> excuse me, We've been told that there are so many protocols, but we, every time we ask about how to do something, we are steered another way. Um, people are feeling frustration. They are feeling emotional fatigue, headaches, confusion, crying, irritability, and burnout. I don't know if you know what burnout is, but according to um, the effects of burnout, we are looking at stress in a in high job demand. We have high, I mean, high stress. Our job demand is critical. We have limited resources. We're told to make Make it happen, make it happen. Um, and then we may have some other secondary traumas that we are bringing with us. And the biggest problem is we have no one to turn to. We have no one to turn to. In my, in my research, I found that teachers are experiencing more burnout than any other group around the city or across the city. Um, a lot of stressful events that have been occurring, we already know what they are. We know we are now in a third round of pandemic mode. We have COVID-19, we, um, we have Delta, and now we have Omicron, and it, it just keeps on going. It keeps on going. People don't wanna be vaxxed, people can't be vaxxed. Booster shots, we're not getting them, we are getting them. We have children that can't get them. We have children that can get them. We have adults, the same thing. And that's hurting us. Um, we don't know how to set boundaries. We do not know how to say no. Teachers never did know how to say no. We just know how to say yes. And we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make it happen. The one thing that we want to make sure that the one thing that I asked about, the asked the teachers was, what do you, how do you want to relax? How do you want to relax? People never ask us, how do we want to relax? They always say, oh, well, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do this mindful moment in 20 minutes, and then we're going to send you on your way and go on to class and teach class. That's not how I relax. I relax by walking every day. Every day I get out of the building because I need to see sunlight. I need to have, have fresh air. 
I relax by just listening to my music. I relax by listening to a book on, on, on um, audio, on audio books, anything. That's my way, but everyone has their own way. And this is what we need to address. How can we help our teachers relax? How can we help our teachers relieve some of the stress they are putting on? We have been put, we have more stress being put on us now than we have in the past five years. I saw my time. Am I good or do I have, because I have. You are at time, uh, but okay. you will have uh, a round of questions where you can uh, expound on uh, okay. your comments. But thank you for that testimony. Um, next, we have Principal Branch. And I believe this might be the first time you've been with us, uh, Principal Branch. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, it is. Or to your testimony. It definitely is my uh, first time. Are you greetings to everyone? And I apologize in advance. I caught a flat tire trying to go home. I am on the road waiting for Roseide. But I'm good to go. I, I must say, I was going to say it looked like you were outside, but I, I, I wasn't going to address it, but I'm glad you did. If you, yeah, do you uh, do, should we shift your uh, time or, or you're good to oh. go? No, I'm great. I just okay. need to, uh, are you able to show my PowerPoint? If not, I'll just talk from, from what we yes. have. Yes, yeah, staff will present it for you. Give us uh, one second. See the commitment? I am I do see <laughs> standing it. at a gas station. <laughs> I do see it. I do see it. No, I'm good, man. Thank you for having me. Plus, Rosa is going to take like 49 minutes, so. Oh, wow. And that's probably being generous. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Hayworth, are we good on the PowerPoint? It's coming, sir. It's loading a little slowly. Okay, no worries. I was just glad I was able to get Wi-Fi. I had to go from my phone. <laughs> hey, Doctor, yeah, uh, uh, you are you're doing a hotspot from your laptop. I'm assuming. Yes. Got it. Got it. Okay. I'm impressed. Hey, we blended learning school. I should be able to navigate this issue. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm sorry about the background noise. It's not as bad as. But can you see that? Yeah, if y'all can put it on a slideshow, um, it's going to be 13 slides. I'm going to present the first half, and Mrs. Matthias, my humanities coach, will present the second half. So, again, I am Kennard Branch. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, here to talk to you all a little bit about educator wellness at Garfield. And we understand everything that was just stated by our last speaker, which is why we focus so much on the whole educator. So we feel that in order to focus on the whole child, we must focus on the whole educator. Um, that came about a couple of years ago when we were really focusing on whole child. And one of my teachers said, what about the adults? Where's my SEL? And honestly, I hadn't thought about it at the time. But when she when she asked me that, it, it made it known that I had to do something about it. We had to do something about it. So we began to focus on the whole educator. Um, you can navigate to the next slide. So I'm not going to read too much to you from my PowerPoint, or rather disengage in the discussion afterwards. But the work we do around focusing on whole educator we align it specifically to the work we do for work for focusing on the whole child. That way, all of our work is research based, research based, is proven and vetted, and a lot of the strategies and interventions that we put in place for students, we're able to put in place for our teachers. I forgot about my time. Um, I'll just quickly say you all know the Castle Framework. SEL is at the heart of it. And then there's five competencies that we focus on for students and adults that self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, and self-awareness. And we're gonna to speak to how each of these comes alive in our school every day. I'm good. You can move forward. So I won't read this slide to you, but um, for anyone familiar, we have to write comprehensive school plans every school year. Um, 
when we wrote our comprehensive school plan, I think the last three, we began to focus on some of the inequities that have entered public education. So we typically focus on the inequities that our families face. We focus on um, staffing inequities. We, we focus on programmatic inequities and cultural and linguistic inequities. The last few years, we also began to focus on SEL as an inequity. Um, and we have embedded the work we're doing with social emotional learning into our comprehensive school plan. Um, this is a long paragraph to speak about what we do, but when I we when we put it in our comprehensive school plan, that is like our commitment to this to this work. Um, and everybody that's in our school has a part to play in our comprehensive school plan from our students, our teachers, our partners, and our central office supports. So when we embed SEL and equity in there. It is live alive every day, and we focus on removing the inequity that has been presented because we haven't focused on SEL long enough in education. So I will leave it for you all to take a look at, but I'm not going to read through it. Um, you go ahead. So as I said, we we kind of partner with Castle, we work with them a lot. Of course, this panorama that we use to, to administer surveys and get data about our teachers and what they think about our school and how we can support them. And then we also have partnered with Transcend. Um, they have really helped us to focus on staff wellness this school year. So Transcend's well, website is in the link. What we wanna tell you about this is that if you are trying to focus on adult SEL, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. Castle has a plethora of toolkits that our mental health team and our instructional coaches use to teach and focus on adult LCL. Uh, we also have transcend meetings through our superintendent, um, Katie Larkin. She has us meeting with them at least once or twice a month to show how we can incorporate wellness in our classrooms and for our adults. So whatever we learn from Transcend, we teach it to our staff and then there's a turnaround training where our staff implements that lessons and learnings with our teachers, our students, I'm sorry. Um, and we're able, through these partnerships, we're able to specifically focus on those five competencies of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And the data we receive from Panorama when we do those surveys, we do surveys twice a year, where teachers essentially get to evaluate myself and my leadership team. We take that data and it drives our next steps as to how we can improve adult SCL throughout our building. You go ahead. Um, I think I have two more slides left. So this slide here, when we look at the competency on self-awareness, this was one of the activities that we did during our 30 minute morning block. And Mrs. Matthias will let you know a little later how it connects to our work on being an anti-racist school. But we want our teachers to become self-aware. So they had to create what we call identity portraits and it showcases your outer and inner identities. So during our 30 minute morning block, you had to create a portrait of yourself. The left side of your portrait is what we see on you every day, like what you bring every day when you show up. And the inside, the right is about what's inside of you, right? So it lets everyone get to know you much better. It makes you much more aware of yourself. And then through Panorama, there is a strategy that specifically helps you unpack that educator identity. There's a goal that you work on and there's materials so that your teachers or your school leaders can implement this at their, at their schools and make sure that everyone is self-aware and knows their inner and outer identities, which is very important as we get into knowing your racial identity and positive racial identities. I think this is my last one before Ms. Tyus goes. You can go ahead. Um, this is the second, stay back, stay on self-management. Or maybe it's just my screen. Okay, so self-management, of course, you all know that's important for our children. 
my clicker is presenters even so self-management you all know how important that is for our children so one of the things that came about from the panorama survey is that we learned that 40 percent of our teachers wanted to be put in charge of something more important and they wanted to take in different leadership opportunities um one of the things we're doing this year is reading this book called the racial healing handbook we selected that book back in june because we felt it was the best book to show practical ways that you could become anti-racist and that you could um, teach everyone about being anti-racist without any of us being true experts in anti-racism. So we're all learning together. The self-management piece comes in because those 40% of people who said they wanted to be more involved, they get to lead this book study. These are paraprofessionals and teachers who are leading book studies and I think last year or the year before when the pandemic first hit, we also uh, partnered with Harvard University and we all were retrained or trained for the first time in data wise and meeting wise. Meeting wise, meeting -wise gives you protocols to, to run these like perfect meetings, no matter who you are. If you have a meeting with two parents who are upset with each other, you can run a meeting wise <laughs> agenda and it'll be a perfect meeting. Um, so, most of you are probably familiar with the eight steps of the data wise improvement process that is our school wide model that we follow to improve or fix anything i won't go through all eight steps but it is there so you can see it but the majority uh we it's all about preparation inquiries and then actions what's great here about self-management before i go is that as you start getting these new roles you also had to notice you still had to do your regular work and you had to take care of yourself. So you had to be well managed because we don't want to put anything on you, whether you asked for it or it was another demand that is causing you stress or anything like that. So self management is extremely important when you take on new roles inside of a school building. And I'm going to turn it, I believe I could turn it to Mrs. Matthias to go through the remainder of the slides, if that's all right with you all. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Branch, we are out of time. Well, this is what I'll propose. Let's go through. Um, let, is uh, Ms. Matthias on right now? Yeah. Okay, Ms. Matthias, we, we will give you uh, two minutes to just share your part because I do want to get your voice in here. We are over time, but because of your commitment, Principal Branch, I'm going to give grace and extend the time. Um, so Thank Ms. you. Matthias, uh, if you could keep it to two minutes just to honor uh, our time commitments, that would be great. Will do. Um, thank you everyone for having us. Uh, moving on to social awareness, as Principal Branch spoke uh, to you previously, we did engage in a book study. Uh, we're also pushing outdoor learning at Garfield. So we had uh, three bonfires and we had teacher leaders lead us through our uh, book study on being uh, through, through our racial healing handbook. Uh, we also focus on thir the 13 principles from Black Lives Matter Year of Purpose at our school. Um, it doesn't end at a week, it's every year for us. Um, and we also have show, we show evidence of this in our comprehensive school plan as well. So everything is pre-planned and laid out. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, social awareness, uh, as mentioned before, is laid out in our CSP, and you can see evidence that this is also available through the tools mentioned before. You can get resources from CASEL, you can get resources from Panorama, um, just really emphasizing that it's there for us to use. <laughs> and we can move forward. Our relationship skills are vital to any educator or any business. Um, and so we do engage in restorative circles and restorative practices at Garfield. Um, you can use these as Principal Branch was mentioning before uh, with meeting wise, you can use restorative practices with the uh, educators in your building. Students can use them with each other uh, and with families or with anyone really. Um, and so we've ha had the opportunity to receive training in this and to implement it and have found it to be um, quite successful with our educators to help empower them. Um, and we can move forward. 
Uh, we also encourage responsible decision-making. Uh, one of our mottos is be the best. And we truly believe that our educators are experts in their role. Uh, we have an abundance mentality. Uh, cre uh, creative confidence is written by these two gentlemen, their, their brothers. Um, we got to research and learn a little bit more about them through our city bridge uh, scholar or application that we were trying to get for a grant. Um, and our teachers really engage in that shared leadership and they run with it. Uh, we have quite a few teacher leaders at our school and it helps create a sense of autonomy. And next slide. Uh, so we focus on wellness at Garfield. It's important to us. Um, and Principal Branch has provided us with some artifacts to help showcase how we do that. Um, the next slide should show one of those artifacts. Uh, here we have our staff wellness calendar. You can see for each month, there is a focus. Also, Principal Branch has a shared school calendar with us. If we go in to our Outlook calendar, it says no emails past five o'clock, uh, time for SEL. Uh, so it's a reminder. Uh, I do not send emails after five o'clock and neither do the educators. It's time for you, time for your family. Um, same thing when um, planning happens, we try to really solidify that for our educators and make sure that that time is for them. And next slide is our last slide. We made it. And if you want, yes. check it out. Garfield's Virtual Wellness Center has a great resources for anyone to use. And we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Guys. Yes, no, thank you. Uh, it's always great when uh, school leaders and educators bring artifacts. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Um, next up in our panel, we have, uh, I just wanna make sure I'm going in order. Uh, Dr. Price, uh, you may begin. Thank you. I think you're going to, um, John Paul, if you were going to maybe bring up the slides that I have, if you don't mind. Terrific, thank you. Um, let me start the timer here. Thank you, so I'm Olga Costa-Price. I'm associate professor at GW at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Um, if you can advance to the next slide. I just did wanna take the liberty of, of sharing with you. Um, we are uh, the center that I direct. I'm the director of the Center for Health and Healthcare in Schools, just because it's an, a resource that I hope that both the, the board as, as well as our uh, other LEA and schools um, will take advantage of as needed. We are an applied research center, a technical assistance center, um, and we, pride ourselves in operating at the intersection of, of health and education and public health and family and community systems. Um, I think one of the things that makes us unique is we're trying to advance strong, effective school health policies, programs, and practices with really an eye on the conditions in which those programs and practices occur and on the determinants around that help kind of influence and guide those. And if you move forward, um, and as I said, this is sort of part of, you know, we employ school connected approaches and one where we um, use the lens in public health, although I'm, I, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and school behavioral health is my expertise. Um, public health is really uh, kind of the framing that we use for all of our work. Next. Um, that, that we are happy to share in, on the slides, which you will hopefully get. You'll have the link to our website, which has a lot of different resources, um, tip sheets, uh, kits, and uh, synthesis of materials and information um, around our research policy and practice work. And this is just a link to some of those. Next. But what I want to say is we've been really proud to be involved and to um, have a presence in what is really an unprecedented focus on school behavioral health that has been happening in Washington, D.C. Um, I personally, but also my center, have been involved in what has been a longstanding commitment to expanding comprehensive school behavioral health services and programs in schools for the last 20 years. And um, it has led to my center actually having a contract with the city to help facilitate what is known as a community of practice of providers and educators across the city who are really trying to work together with community-based organizations 
to expand the services and supports that are available to all children and families, and now also um, to educators and staff. Next. And this is just a quick graphic to show you that this initiative, which is again, a very big investment of resources, money and time that are being, um, that have been uh, brought together um, to benefit our, our young people and families um, starts with this coordinating council and um, has a number of, of elements and structures to it. One of which is a work group, it's a little hard to see on teacher wellness, which um, is generated as an interest and an area of focus that the community itself, meaning our members, our educators, providers, practitioners have all said, must be a priority for us in our work. So two years ago, we established this work group of very committed individuals who continue to meet monthly to create and uh, cultivate resources. Next, this is an example on the next slide of um, what we call a Padlet, which is, uh, which is a platform that you can use um, with lots of resources um, that have been really curated by our community members, by educators in DC, by providers, by, by parent advocates, um, and where we continue the dialogue of what do we want? What does this mean? What goals can we set together? And this is a publicly open space. So again, you'll have the Padlet link. I really encourage you to look at it. We have tremendous resources the community has brought together. Next. But what I really wanted to share is a, a, a resource that we have, uh, I'll have you go to the next slide, um, that really indicates that um, one, I, I co-authored this brief with uh, a, a professor of education um, that is a resource that again was hopefully made available to you that says two main things. One is that um, burnout and teacher burnout can be thought of distinctively and differently from teacher demoralization and that although both are occurring, they're not the same. And the strategies we might bring forth to address them are complementary, but also distinct. Burnout being that we are may feel a sense of uh, individually having no internal resources being so put upon and, and so many demands um, that our resources are spent. But demoralization also being one where you feel like you're not able to perform your job in terms of the mission and what brought you to this position and, uh, and what drives you and that that is undermined and that creates a sense of demoralization that again is a little different from burnout. Next. The last thing I'll say here is, is the other shift we like people to understand, and this is a research brief that these um, that we have often used much of our rhetoric and our talks around how to support teacher wellness by stopping at self care practices and those being sort of the ones that we need to promote, um, and those are very important. Understanding our self care practices and what we have to do to care for ourselves is must be a priority. But it also puts the onus and responsibility on individuals to promote those. And what this brief talks about is how important it is to create health promoting environments. And in this case, school promoting, uh, health promoting environments that create the conditions in which self-care can actually be um, expanded. I think I'm at time, so I will end there and happy to take questions later and can share examples of what we mean. Thank you. Thank you. Um... The chat was ablaze uh, about Padlet, so uh, I'm Padlet. looking forward to the questions. Uh, right. Next, we will have Ms. Olsa. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Johanna Alseth, and I am the Family Engagement and Wellness Manager at BRIA PCS. I've had the privilege of working at BRIA for four years, but this is actually a new role for me that we advocated for um, this year as a result of um, the impacts of the pandemic on our staff and students and really wanting to uh, redouble down on our, um, our focus on, on wellness. Um, actually, I was gonna, I could share my screen for my PowerPoint. Um, that's okay. One second. Oh, you can share your screen. All right, can y'all see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so really quick, before I get um, started, I just want to highlight this photo right here. I'm going to speak more on this in a second, but this is a picture of one of our um, early childhood teams that competed in our staff wellness challenge. We had a six week um, step challenge that was a huge hit and a wonderful way for um, staff to connect um, after 
um, a really challenging, you know, 19 months. So I'll speak about that in a minute. Um, so really quick, uh, Bria is a two generational charter school for immigrant families in DC. We have four different locations um, in wards one, four, and five, and serve 900 students with a staff of 150. Um, we also have a community school model, which has been really beneficial in our um, approach to supporting student and staff wellness because we have really wonderful um, partnerships with uh, our organizations in the community, um, including Mary Center, which is a public health center that three of our locations are um, connected with. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, staff moved really quickly um, and creatively to support students um, with uh, virtual and hybrid learning. We were able to open one of the first large scale outdoor learning programs in DC for students. We connected our students with um, a lot of social services and support and also developed a weekly virtual student wellness program to strengthen engagement and support students in their wellness practices um, during this time. Um, but we noticed that because of all the changes and um, just adapting to this new reality that staff, we, staff really um, were negatively impacted by a lot of the, um, the changes. And so we really wanted to um, kind of shift our focus from what are you doing to take care of yourself to creating a culture of care for staff. Um, we observed and heard and, and experienced ourselves those feelings of burnout that were mentioned earlier, um, stress, exhaustion, um, you know, fear. And so we realized that we really wanted to do something about it. So I was able to join the group that Olga, that Dr. Price um, mentioned, um, the teacher wellness work group uh, a year ago. Um, and it was so amazing. I was so inspired by what so many schools and practitioners are doing across the city and really felt motivated to kind of create our own internal Bria wellness group. So I'm gonna share a little bit with you about that. So Bria Wellness Group is our kind of our wellness task force, and we meet monthly to discuss ways to promote wellness among our staff and students. And we have different members across all departments at Bria. So we have adult education, early childhood, our student services, um, director of professional development and academic support. And actually it was interesting because someone noted in our last meeting that unfortunately we don't have too many teachers who are able to participate because of their workload and schedules. So we are trying to work on that, but it is really special because we have a lot of different perspectives and ideas and people who do work um, very closely with teachers. So we're able to hear what people um, really need. And this group serves as kind of a bridge between our, our teachers and our leadership. So when we first had our um, BWG meeting, our Bria Wellness Group meeting, we used this tool called the Eight Dimensions of Wellness, this framework to really help us uh, broaden our horizon when it comes to wellness support and programming and recognizing that we have all different um, needs and practices and one, one area um, might be prioritized differently in one person's life. So it's really important for us to have a holistic view of that support when working with students and staff. So internally in our BWG meeting, we had um, just a small conversation about how we were all experiencing um, feelings of burnout. And it was extremely comforting and validating within those 13 members to share how we were doing. And we realized, you know, maybe we should talk about this as a whole school. Maybe this would be helpful to name it. Um, and so we had an all staff meeting with 150 of our, our BRIA staff members. And we talked about the signs and symptoms and ideas for self-care. And it was really well received. Um, staff members expressed feeling seen and heard and just really appreciated it. But we realized that a lot of the focus was more on self-care rather than uh, you know, community care and more structural shifts to support the individual. And so our next all staff meeting, we decided to have um, a session and dialogue where we can get input from all members from all teachers. And so we um, talked about these three questions, um, asking them when they feel, how they feel supported by the community, what is their BRIA department doing um, currently to address burnout and what can we do? What is one thing that you think we could do to prevent staff burnout? 
And here are some of their ideas that they shared with us. So one of the main things was an awareness of workload and more time for, for planning and more time for, for rest and just breaks, not trying to put as much into people's schedules as, um, as before the pandemic. Uh, normalizing mental health days, taking st stretch breaks during long meetings, especially virtual ones, um, teacher support groups, um, better boundaries for sending emails after work hours, on-site exercise classes, half days on Fridays, walking meetings and check-ins and providing subs for teachers um, at BRIA who are outside of BRIA. So a lot of this input was taken into consideration and, and there was actually um, action steps that were done that were created based on staff input. And we're gonna continue to have these conversations as the landscape changes to um, really support and listen to our teachers and staff. I can't see the time, so hopefully I'm okay. Um, I want to share a little bit more about Bria, Bria Wellness Initiatives. And you are over, uh, oh. but uh, take let's take five to 10 seconds to just wrap up. In okay. The, yeah. Basically, um, our Bria Wellness Initiatives, um, the main objective is to create that sense of community, that sense of connection um, for people to you know, not feel alone and really create a community where we can collaborate about best practices for wellness um, and supporting everyone. I would love to share more about our um, wellness challenges and, and wellness raffle, but maybe that'll be a question for later. So thank you. Yes, uh, this is amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then next up we have Ms. Fornil. Wonderful, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Jenna Fornell, and I am the Director of Teaching and Learning at Center for Inspired Teaching. We're a DC-based nonprofit organization that has served the area for 26 years, providing professional development to teachers and whole school partnerships, both in DC public and public charter schools. I appreciate being invited here tonight to talk about educator wellness and retention. And I second the concerns fellow panelists have shared. And it's also so inspiring to hear these examples of incredible supports that individual schools are providing. For Inspired Teaching's testimony, I'm going to zoom out a bit and talk big picture because we work with lots of different teachers from lots of different schools. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a way to think about um, this question of how we might approach support um, from, a, from a systems perspective. So COVID threw much of what we thought we knew about schools out of the box. Um, and it doesn't make sense as we work on recovering while the pandemic still rages to keep ourselves inside that box. And we've heard lots of different out of the box examples of thinking tonight, um, but that's not happening everywhere. Um, so it no longer serves us and teachers and children deserve and need more. So I wanna offer a framework through which we can think about our approach to the solution. At Inspired Teaching, we use a tool with teachers pulled from psychologist William Glasser's work called the ABCDE of Learners Needs. It identifies five psychological needs that must be met in order for learners to thrive. And these needs are autonomy, belonging, competence, developmental appropriateness, and engagement. So let's consider these needs for a minute in the context of teachers right now, but also over the past many years. How much autonomy do they have to make decisions about how and what they teach? What experiences in the course of a year enhance their feelings of belonging and appreciation within a school community, within our broader city? Do our evaluation practices and professional development offerings enhance or undermine their sense of competence? Are our expectations and support systems appropriately aiding their development within the profession? Is teaching still an engaging job? For the vast majority of teachers, these needs are not being met. This is largely because in our quest to improve student achievement, we have chosen to focus on compliance rather than engagement. In the midst of our first pandemic year when standardized tests were waived and the general consensus was that we needed to focus on student well-being rather than scores, there was a hope that things might change. But once teachers returned to their buildings, panic set in about making up for lost learning. And while that is vitally important, if we let ourselves be motivated by panic, we won't get good results. So what do we do about this? When Inspired Teaching uses the ABCDE framework with teachers, we talk about figuring out what needs aren't being met 
and shifting their instructional approach to meet them. The same framework can be applied when we look at teachers themselves. So here are a few examples. For autonomy, when teachers play an active role in school decision making, and we heard some examples tonight, everyone benefits. In our institutes, teachers name school factors that are in and out of their control, and then collaboratively we come up with ways to address these pain points. What can be taken off the table this year to make space for their ideas? Belonging. Teachers really, they're fine with donuts on Fridays, but as a token of appreciation, but they do, they really do want to feel appreciated beyond that. So what if we strive to elevate and shine a light on teachers who are doing good teaching under these extraordinary circumstances? Competence. Teachers know that their students are not okay and they want to help. What might happen to their sense of competence if we elevate building relationships and creating engaging learning experiences to an equal or higher level than covering chapters in the textbook? Developmental appropriateness. Now is not the time to introduce new professional requirements, but mentors can be lifelines through challenge. What if every teacher had a mentor who wasn't there to evaluate them, but to listen to what they're going through? Do we have retired teachers in our community who could fill that role? Engagement. What makes your work engagement engaging? For most of us, the answer involves things that matter, working with people that we care about, balancing challenge with fun. The same is true for teaching. What if we make these things, relationships, fun, purposeful, creative challenge, the things we prioritize more when we talk about school and when we support schools? In order to keep teachers well and in the profession, we have to fundamentally rethink what we are asking of them. In our partnerships with schools over the years, we found that when we prioritize meeting the needs that lead to engagement, we see a change in outcomes. Job satisfaction increases, school culture improves, student learning increases. A focus on the ABCDEs of teacher needs will not only help them, but also the children that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, we will now move to the question uh, portion. We are going to do one three minute round. Um, and so if you could raise your hands, I will call on you as I see hands. And first up um, is Representative O'Sullivan. And I will just note if there were any panelists that were not able to, well, actually, before I go to you, uh, Representative O'Sullivan, were there any panelists that were not able to get out any salient points that you think are just critical to tonight's discussion? I'm happy to give up my time for you to just finish that point. And I believe I may have cut you off, Ms. Olseth, uh, and maybe you, Ms. Bradshaw-Smith, or you think you're good? Um, just, just, um, just one, one thing. Everyone has said everything that is that I that were in my findings, um, but I wanted to make sure that I did say. Uh, after doing our my research, I found that teachers want to have a say in what they want to do. That's that's the main thing. We want to have a say into what we want to do or what we can do. That's, our, that's my major point. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, not seeing any other takers, uh, I will reclaim my time. Uh, or Ms. Math Mathias, did you wanna share something? Um, I did not have my hand raised, but I'm happy to share that yes, I agree. Teachers deserve a seat at the table um, and that you have more success when you um, appreciate and value them. Um, shared leadership is a, an important quality uh, to make any institution run effectively. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, we are gonna go to you first, uh, Representative O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, President Parker. And thanks to each of you guys for joining us. I found this a very um, interesting discussion uh, and I found each of you guys' presentations to be very informative. Also from like a student perspective, just hearing about some of these things. I was talking to my uh, philosophy teacher yesterday about how there's always like a shift maybe between middle school and high school where students are like, wait, teachers actually have real lives outside of school. Um, and so I just appreciate your guys' presentation. Um, my first question is uh, for the Garfield team. Um, I'm not sure if principal branch is still there, um, but, uh, oh, there you are. Uh, thank you so much. My question was, I, I was very intrigued by like the no emails past 5 p.m. policy. And I, I sort of wanted to know like, 
where did that come from? And how did you guys sort of decide that that's something that would be effective? Um, Matthias may have to jump in because I can't remember the exact resource, but I think one of my pre-K three teachers had shared it with me at the height of the pandemic. Um, and it was something for teachers to have more balance in their in their lives. And then I, I had a chance to read the research and I think watch a short video on it. Um, and I started to do it for myself. I, I was like, I'm not gonna keep emailing Central back and forth at six, seven, eight, nine o'clock. And then I saw that it, it, it like lifted something off of me, right? Um, <laughs> it was like a sense of relief. And I was like, I'm gonna do this for the teachers. Um, no emails after, after five o'clock. I was really trying to give them time with their families, their children, their, their friends and their loved ones, right? Garfield will be here tomorrow. It is not going to burn down. So don't email. One teacher, I was like, I'm going to write you up if you send another e email at the five o'clock. Like, stop. So I just tried to be a model of it because I felt like that was one way I can target self-care, right? I, I try to show everybody you don't always have to spend tons of money to, for self-care. And that was one way that I can target self-care and give you your time back is that we honor this commitment to not email each other at the five o'clock. Hmm. So that's our business hours kind of at Garfield. <laughs> I really like that. Thank you so much, Principal Branch. I had another question um, for Ms. Olseth. Uh, the, the, the slide about gaining staff input. I just wanted like quickly to ask you like, what's the best way you think schools can go about doing that? Um, thanks, Alex. We're actually, um, well, we're in the process of creating a staff wellness survey um, to administer in January. But I think a lot of it is just um, through those relationships and like one on one conversations or in, in group conversations. A lot of times you're going to get more information about what people want and need um, in, in those interactions. But I do think a staff wellness survey with the right questions is really useful. So actually with the BWG, our Bria Wellness Group, we are um, working um, with another partner organization, Minds Inc. And they are going to be helping us um, create a survey um, to learn more about what staff um, wellness will, uh, what, what staff want in terms of wellness for um, the next semester. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up is Representative Reed. Uh, thank you, Garfield team, for being here after 5 p.m. It's much appreciated. Um, but, you know, this is what you do on a daily basis, going above and beyond. And uh, Principal Branch, please be safe out there as you're waiting to get your tire changed. I'm good. Um, cool. Um, so I, I want to relate this because um, we're talking about teacher wellness, but a big topic tonight is as well as the star rating system, our school accountability system. Um, and I was curious in regards to the information you presented tonight um, related to school climate or related to um, incorporating the information like that you presented this evening into the star rating system. So, for instance, like based on what you presented, um, how do you feel like either school climate or teacher retention could be um, included in how your schools are evaluated for those who have schools? But I want to start with the Ward 8 schools particularly. We can we can answer yeah. Mm -hmm. Us. I'll wait if no one else wants to go. Is it for you or Matthias? <laughs> oh, it's for me or Matthias. Uh -huh. oh. uh, Matthias, you want to go? Or? You go. Um, well, yeah, I would love for those metrics to be incorporated into the star rating system. It's a lot of things that we do at our school and that other schools do that don't always get highlighted. A lot of times you, you you see test scores and things of that nature, and they don't really tell the story of all the great things that are going on at our schools. And those little things that we do outside of the test scores are actually what make our teachers keep coming back year after year, make our families stay with us and make our students stay with us. So I would love for that to be a part of the star rating to show um, things that we are doing in addition to or in addition to certain test scores like the the part gotcha yeah because car i was taking around your your old report card and garfield has pretty strong teacher retention as well as school leadership that's been there for years mm -hmm. um bria also i've been to your building a while ago and has a pretty good culture i'm not sure if you all want to chime in 
Yeah, I would actually say one one way that um, students uh, frequently describe Bria is like a, a big family. Um, and I think staff feel that way as well because we place so much um, importance and focus on building relationships. Um, you know, of course, it was a lot easier before the pandemic. We would have site socials. We would have, you know, a lot of different activities together, Zumba classes, just a lot of fun ways to build a community. And so we're trying to find new and creative ways to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that um, a lot of our staff members have been here for, you know, since we started 30 years ago, 20 years ago. So um, I, would, I would rate us high on that, that school climate. Yeah, I think those would increase our star, star ratings and at a much faster pace as well. Thank you, that's my time. Uh, Representative Sutter. Thank you, President Parker. Um, I appreciate everything I heard tonight. And one thing I noticed is that there's a lot of commonalities in the different ways that both research and practice in schools is managing this question of both teacher burnout and teacher demoralization. Um, I also really like hearing that distinction and the, under, the importance of understanding it. Tomorrow, the council is having a hearing on teacher retention and principal retention. And I'm curious, are there things that council, which can legislate and or provide funding, um, could do that would enable schools like Garfield, like Bria, uh, like Inspired Teaching um, to be able to do their work better? Is that directed to anyone in particular? Anyone, yep, feel free. Oh. We would always accept any funding. <laughs> um, money, got it, good. Yeah. And I, and I would certainly say that I, I think um, I would never say, you know, schools don't need more funding, but I also think that, um, you know, some of the research also bears out that, uh, for example, you know, increasing teacher pay, which we all should advocate for, is not necessarily a, um, is the way that, it is not the predictor for teacher retention and principal retention. It's important. We don't, I don't want to minimize that. But um, I also think that, as was said, um, the ways that you we can um, recognize the um, investment in relationships that are done at each school building, uh, the, um, the mechanisms by which we can make sure we have bi-directional communication, not just this is what I as a leader I'm gonna do for you, to you, with you, but what I need to hear um, so that, uh, and so, you know, institutionalizing um, in some ways or incentivizing, facilitating ways that that kind of constant feedback, the way these schools have mentioned, they have invested in from their staff, from their educators. Um, you know, I, I fall short on sort of, I, I'm legislating some of those practices, but really the ways that those can be incentivized and become normalized practices. Um, I think is uh, expectations, um, but I certainly think there's a role for, for that. I love the idea of ways that, you know, that the metrics of teacher wellness, retention, and climate could, could be elevated in importance um, as a way to also show, demonstrate success. Um, those, I'll stop there. I would just add, if we could, one thing is uh, training for principals or school leaders around emotional intelligence. That was one thing that really helped me to like be a nicer, better person and better school leader is to strengthen my own emotional intelligence and know how to connect and with people and manage my emotions, help manage their emotions. And a, a thing that would be really valuable is like an on-site therapist, uh, kind of like when police have a shooting, a bad shooting or whatever, and they have someone on site that they can go talk to for therapy ongoing. Um, I think teachers and principals need that in their buildings, right? You, you might have had this bad day, you got this going on. You need someone that you can go talk to right there in the office. So like an on-site therapist would be great, I think, for, for retention because that way you're not getting burned out, you're not stressed out. You, there's someone there that you can talk to on an ongoing basis. Um, I know principals and teachers definitely need that. Thank you both very much. That's my time. Uh, Representative Ching. Thank you. 
Uh, this point about funding uh, is, is interesting to me. I'm curious, uh, and, and not asking anyone in particular, anyone who wants to chime in about this, how you would allocate funds differently than how we're doing it right now to better prioritize teacher wellness. I would say that um, Johanna didn't um, maybe um, toot her own horn as much as others uh, of us might, but um, and and the innovation in her school in that um, I, I don't know how this all came about, but that at at Bria they actually established this new role for her to really lead teacher wellness across the school, and um, and so there's a dedicated resource to do that and to um, you know, establish those structures and processes and to follow up on all of those. And again, to be the bridge between practitioners and leadership. Um, you know, that is, I think, um, really worth mentioning that again, short of you know, requiring it for schools, but that, that if there were resources that folks could, who felt ready to, could take advantage of to create those kinds of positions like Johanna's and others, I think that is a um, would yield a lot of value. Yeah, curious to I, hear from others. Yeah, great. I, I I would add to that that one of the things that I'm hearing that's sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back for a lot of teachers right now is schools um, not having enough support staff or having to cover multiple duties, um, particularly when there are substitute shortages. So to the extent that we could invest in creating a, a, a a more extensive substitute pool or um, full-time substitutes that schools could have always on staff available when they had um, the need for them and things that could alleviate the number of additional duties that teachers have. It would create more space for teachers to be able to do collaborative planning, to do professional development. Um, and I know that, that schools are stretched super tight right now to the point where, um, you know, so, so many teachers can be out sometimes that teachers don't even get a break during the day because they're having to cover other people's classes. So I know that that's a major pain point right now. And to the extent we could pro provide more people, that would be great. Right. Uh, and, and I guess that, that that's my follow up too to that of uh, like what the principal just said, having more socio emotional learning opportunities for, for educators. Where do we create space for that? And, and, who do we need to bring in or what resources do we need to bring in to be able to create space for that? Um, substitute teachers is one, I guess in the last 10 seconds, are there other resources or support systems we could fund in the short term? Because a lot of the, a lot of the other recs are, uh, seem to be long-term solutions. And I'm I gonna add uh, to, that, to the chat, sorry, uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, we do have a long list of, folks signed up for public comment that we uh, need to get to. Uh, next up, Representative Thompson. Uh, given that we do have uh, a bunch of people signed up for public comment, uh, I wanna thank the panel. Uh, I also was struck by the uh, differentiation between uh, burnout uh, and you know just the moralization uh, that people are suffering. So I appreciate that. I'm happy to follow up uh, with the panel offline um, and, you know, I just appreciate your time and insights. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Leary. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, I just have one question uh, because it seems to me that the, the crux of this whole problem is that the systems haven't uh, addressed it and that there isn't time uh, put into the school days for people to be able to breathe. Um, I'm not going to say any more. I'm testifying tomorrow on the teacher retention and principal retention, and uh, it'll be the same uh, testimony. But I really appreciate it uh, for what y'all had to say, because it's a huge problem. But if the system doesn't address it as a problem, a critical problem, a problem that influences all of the students in the building and everyone else that's working in the building. And it has to be taken care of. Uh, I, I, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, uh, Representative Lopez. Thank you, President Parker. 
Um, so I think first and foremost, I really appreciate everyone being here and sharing their thoughts. This is uh, this is a very important topic to me and that we're taking the, the steps to address it, considering that I myself want to join the educator team and become a teacher. And so, okay, I really like the staff wellness calendar that uh, Principal Branch shared with us. And if you, the Fartfield team doesn't mind, I would like to share this with my school and see if this is something that they would like to implement. Um, because I really think this would be helpful for them. And then second thing, Alex talked about students being uh, surprised when they hear that teachers have an outside life. So going off of that, my question is, do you think that, and this is for everyone, do you think it would be helpful for students and teacher, teachers to participate in some sort of social emotional learning activity together? so that they can see that they're both going through something um, and it's not just the students. Can I, can I jump in? Thank you so much for that, Juliana. Um, personally, I think yes, but I also think that they need to be separate before they are together. Because again, you are going through and we are going through. Once we figure out where we are, then we can definitely come together because at, on the high school level, we really don't get a chance to see you but once, if that, you know, so we see the growth, we see the need, but we don't see it again until you graduate. So it would be wonderful if we could have a, 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 a togetherness of the student body and the staff members. And just to piggyback off of what you were saying about Principal Branch, I would love to be, I would love to come over to the school just to see how it works, how you work that out. Because if I know you can do it on the elementary level, but I want to see how, how we can work it out on the high school level. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, and my next question was actually for you, Miss Ms. Smith. Um, so I took a look at the recommendations that you wrote in your written testimony, and I was intrigued by your second recommendation, which says facilitate whole school mindful moments during morning breaks, such as homeroom or morning circle time. And I know that my school has attempted to do some sort of mindful moment every morning for at least, ooh, I'm running out of time, for at least uh, <laughs> some 10 seconds altogether. But not everyone engages in this, not everyone participates. So how do you, how do you view this happening so that everyone participates? We only have five seconds. I, I, I have a vision of it and it's hard to put in words in just this little crunch time, but we can talk offline because it is something that I hope can happen because I know when I first started working, it did happen. So I know that it can, it can happen. Thank you, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great questions, Representative Lopez. Uh, next up is Vice President Kasoy. Thank you. I actually, my question was also for you, Ms. Brad Shuss Smith. So if you want to finish your thought um, in response to uh, Representative Lopez, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, as I was saying, when I first started working, we had homerooms. And every day we had a, what we didn't call it mindful moment at that time, because I've been working for 30 plus years. We just called it uh, just a gathering where the principal would come on, give us announcements, and then the teachers and then the homeroom teachers would come in and we would have conversations with our students. So we got a chance to know them. We got a chance to know their families, their moms, their dads, what's going on. If there was something going on with, us, with, a, with another teacher, we were able to have that conversation with them and be that go-between for the parents. So that, that's why I know it can happen. It's just that we have to take the time and want it to happen. We have to make that choice. Thank you. My, mm -hmm. my follow-up question is, um, I'm assuming from your testimony that a lot of the strategies that were described by um, the Garfield team and um, Ms. Elseth are not happening at your school. And so I guess I'm just curious to know what you think it might take to bring that to 
or some elements at least to your school setting. Mm. Wow. Openness. Openness and, and willingness to actually have a let go of power uh, where people are empowering each other instead of one person saying, okay, this is what's going on. Everybody is talking. Everybody has a seat at the table because I wish that it were, I, I mean, what's going on at Garfield is awesome. What's going on at um, Bria is wonderful, but we aren't able to replicate that because people want power. And that's what it seems like. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can I actually, so um, Dr. Branch, I would love to hear from you a little bit more about the leadership training mm -hmm. in that vein. Um, and I only have 25 seconds, so. I'm sorry, say it again. I was talking to the um, tired driver. Oh no, yeah. I'm sorry. So um, just what kind of training, can you say more about training for leadership in terms of like, creating the culture that we've been talking about like how do you share uh you know power basically or give up a little bit so others can have some but i'm out of time so maybe uh, answer in the chat if you can or we can follow up so thank I'll you try to, i'll try to put it in the chat but i will tell you that at garfield everybody is the principal we don't care about anybody's title it is like 60 principals that runs our school um but i can talk to you about like distributive leadership classes I had to take at Georgetown, um, classes that my coaches are, are taking, and how we all just know that we can't be great unless everybody is on board. But I can put some stuff in the, in the chat to, that may be beneficial. How do you get there? That's the question. Thank you. Got you. Um, Got you. I'm going to reclaim one minute of my time uh, so we don't have to use the whole three minutes. My, my simple question is, if a school is not uh, where you all are describing and perhaps the culture is not all the, the best, what is the entry point that you would recommend um, to turning uh, the culture around for teacher wellness? Yes, Ms. Uh, Cornell. Um, I, I would go back to something that um, Ms. Bradshaw Smith said, it's it's asking the teachers. So the first thing would be to find out from them um, because they will tell you if you give them an opportunity to listen, but know that if you are going to ask them, be prepared to act on some of the things they have to say because it erodes trust if we ask and we don't act on what, what they share. Thank you for that. And I, I would just say, if you're not at that place, start with one teacher. Like uh, a lot of stuff we did, was always a pilot with like one or two people. And then we was able to get more or more people on board. But our most successful initiatives come when a teacher is on board and they can speak to how something is making their life easier, how it's not another thing on their plate and they could bring more teachers on. I, don't, I can't get none of that stuff done. Uh, <laughs> my teachers and my coaches knock it out for me. I love that. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I really appreciate it. Um, and there's so much more that we want to learn from you all. We will certainly follow up with additional questions should members have them. Um, and Principal Branch, I, I, uh, I'm going to propose to Representative uh, Reed that we arrange a state board visit to Garfield sometime uh, soon so we can see all of the awesomeness in action. Um, and so thank you all for your time. Uh, Principal Branch, I hope you make it home safely. Uh, and we really do appreciate you all sharing with us today. Um, my apologies if you hear music in the background, but we are going to move forward uh, to the public comment portion of our meeting. Um, at every public meeting, we hear testimony from witnesses on a, a, a number of education-related matters. Tonight will be no different. Uh, your comments uh, become part of the official record. Uh, if you would like to speak at a future public meeting, please feel free to sign up on our website at sboe.dc.gov or contact our staff by email at sboe.dc.gov.
Uh, tonight, we will hear from 36 public witnesses, including those who have submitted uh, written testimony. Uh, we will be holding to a very strict time limit of three minutes for our witnesses. Uh, while you speak, there will be a timer on your screen if you set your uh, view to gallery mode. Uh, after our witnesses speak, uh, we will entertain questions. Uh, members will have two minutes for their question, as well as the answer from uh, those testifying. Uh, Mr. Hayworth will call the witnesses in groups of five, as well as the question period. Uh, he will also um, fortunately have to meet witnesses and board members uh, if you exceed your time. So with that, uh, Mr. Hayworth, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to take us forward in our public comment portion of our meeting. So I'm seeing members, uh, or uh, I'm assuming uh, members of the public ready to testify. Uh, my view, I'm seeing uh, Mr. Hayworth's screen glitching a bit. Um, so with that, uh, Darren, if you are available, uh, I'm gonna just get us started for the sake of time. Um, and I'm gonna call uh, members, I don't have the list right in front of me, but uh, I'm gonna start as I see you on my screen, if that works. Um, and we will start with you, uh, Ms. Carrie Savage. You will have three minutes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Fuchs, are you ready by any chance? Sure. That's okay. Uh, sorry to put you on a spot. Ms. Savage will come uh, back to you after Ms. Fuchs. All right. Um, okay. So two years ago, almost on this exact day, I gave testimony on the need for our city to look beyond the stars. To quote myself, Aussie's current report card and the SBOE's approval of its content has created a system that creates winners and losers and sets up schools to fail. It is toxic, it encourages bad behavior amongst adults, and it prioritizes what is easy over what is right. And if those who work in offices downtown and seek to make policy and report cards about our schools could from time to time remember those of us working in schools are human beings serving other human beings and not problems or deficiencies, maybe we wouldn't be where we are now. Two years ago, I was before the SBOE announcing that we had our first proposed DCPS closure that it was justified largely on the star metrics, attendance rates, enrollment, and park scores. I came before you to point out the destructive nature of the star report card and its inevitable conclusion. I'm back today when the Washington Met is no more, the student community shattered and scattered with many falling through our grasp to reiterate that the summative star rating system does far more harm than good. All of us in this space must take responsibility for the closure of Washington Met. It is all our faults. While the forces at play behind the closure are bigger than the stars, the star report card and the framing that it pushes has dominated how we think about our schools. Phil Mendelssohn to students' faces derided Washington Met as a school students shouldn't be proud of. The chancellor used the star rating in his talking points about why it should be closed. Under the star rating, Aussie perpetuates this toxic environment where school communities are devalued, where the relationships of teachers, students, and the parents hold no value at all, where adults make decisions that impact children for their own benefit. Our students see Ed Fest, they see little press conferences, they see the all-star tours, and when we boil down schools to a single summative rating, it becomes the only thing we talk about. There's no nuance. There's no real purpose beyond the rating itself. And frankly, the rating does not tell us how we can improve. Standardized tests do not tell us how we can improve. They tell us the obvious, that many students from low-income backgrounds are struggling to keep up to the benchmarks that have been set with reading and math skills. The star rating system did not result in oversight that would have stopped DCPS and the mayor from systemically disinvesting in schools like Washington Met, depriving them of stability, adequate resources, and the real programming that would give them a shot at being successful too. The star rating system has not gotten us any closer to equity. The star rating system does not value our students. It judges them from on high. The star rating system allows bureaucrats and offices to feel satisfied with themselves and their work far away from students in these office buildings downtown doing nothing while school community gets proposed to be ripped apart. I'm outraged the way the city treats its students who are struggling, 
Shame on us. Use this vote to do better. Do it for Washington Met. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Fuchs. Um, Ms. Lake, you will be next. And I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Hayworth, but you can uh, get started with your testimony, uh, Ms. Lake. Okay, so I will get started. Good evening, all. It is lovely to be here once more. I am a community member, we're seven, Spanish teacher and an opportunity fellow with Empower at DC. I am an advocate for holistic education and the star rating system does not include holistic education. And we must dismantle this system like right now because it creates a stigma on schools. And it also does not leave room for creativity where our students are more focused on project-based learning, other learning, global exposure and community exposure. As I sit here, I'm very thankful to be part of this process once more, because the first time I was nervous, uh, but it's, it's my hope that I'm able to successfully advocate for our DC students, our educators, and everyone that truly believes in education. Education at its core is really human development. Michael Angelo said at age 87, I'm still learning, and that's something we should push our student to wanna say at 87, right? Um, education right now is reinventing itself before our eyes and working with all approaches is not measuring learning and it's also not and it's inequitable right and it's boring it's stressful and it's just not fun anymore I went to school to become a diplomat but I decided to teach but it's only Wednesday and I have thought about quitting seven times this week because of the level of stress that I am feeling as an educator um, as an educator, I've also questioned my ability to support my students each and every day uh, in their journeys into adulthood. A star rating system is not really getting children prepared for their real outside world. If COVID taught us anything, it taught us that learning doesn't happen only inside of a classroom and it should not be measured by testing. Our children deserve better. Um, like I said, education is human development, you know, we're all humans in here. Therefore, I know that we all value finding joy in education. Many are, of our young humans in DC, in the DC education system are no longer finding joy in this process with the level of stress, pressure, and tension that the education system has. There's no longer joy in learning. We're educating the next generation of global citizens, global leaders, and peace agents. Uh, so we need to start measuring learning differently by using project-based learning, cultural and global exposure. Our children will be representing the United States virtually via TikTok or, you know, or in person one day at the UN. And if we're not equipping them with a global mindset, with finding joy to learning, um, we're not doing the correct job. We're not doing something. We're not measuring joy. We're not... We're just not doing our work. And it's, it breaks my heart to speak like this because every time I used to call my family to talk about my job, it was fun. But now it's like, I'm, I don't feel like I'm being effective. My school leaders are stressed, I'm stressed, and our children and their families are stressed. So that is my testimony for this evening. And I hope it's very clear that the star system is just not good for our children. Thank you. Um, Mr. Goldstein, you are up next. All right, can you hear me? All right, thank you, good evening. Thank you for engaging the public on this critical issue of reforming uh, our school rating system to better support our schools. I wanna start with the question of why we care so much about this rating that many people say they haven't heard of or don't pay much attention to. Cycles of disinvestment and disinvestment from schools begin with their ability to enroll students. And the biggest factor that influences enrollment are both what is said officially about a school and what others through word of mouth communicate about a school. As a current DCPS parent and a former teacher at a one-star school, I know that when even some people pay attention to the rating, that perception of a school concretizes, it becomes enmeshed in the broader public perception and is then very much part of word of mouth conversations about school quality. 
In other words, people don't have to look at the star rating themselves to be influenced by the perception it gives of a school. As you can see in this image, the cycle of, is devastating for schools. A vote to keep a summative rating is a vote to perpetuate the labeling and cycle of disinvestment in the schools that serve the highest population of at-risk students. We strongly favor the proposal by Representative Reed and Wattenberg to highlight and focus on indicators individually rather than add them up to a summative score. Why? Let's use a teaching analogy. I always tried my hardest as a teacher not to put an A to F at the top of a paper. Why? Because if it was an A or a B, students would hardly ever look at the feedback. They'd be happy and tuck it away. If it was a D or F, they'd often get frustrated or angry and they wouldn't look at the feedback either. Great teachers know that to get students to absorb the full feedback so they can grow from it, you have to give targeted feedback without a summative score, which is why we've seen the shift to standards-based grading and education. Let's tell students where they are in each skill separately. Averaging together distinct standards today, together is meaningless and undermines the growth mindset we try to instill. The same is true for how we publicly score schools. This Reed Wattenberg approach is critical because it aligns with educational practice and supporting not shaming our schools. While we agree that the dashboard model, we have to shift the primary indicators we focus on beyond the four proposed by the committee. Empower Ed did a survey um, moving beyond the typical outreach to the most engaged residents, the majority of our responses were pen and paper. We went out to every community spending the most times in Ward 7 and 8 collecting pen and paper responses at school drop-off and pick up at community events, grocery stores, laundry mats, and more. We interviewed many residents who could not read, asking them the questions aloud as interviews one at a time. We asked residents what they think are the most fair and reliable indicators of school quality. As you can see from this, we've shared the results with each of you as well. Your survey and so many others reflect the same thing. The public makes clear that test scores are not a priority for them or viewed as reliable, yet we keep shoving them in their faces, putting those numbers biggest and boldest on proposed ratings or dashboards. Why not focus on what people are actually telling us they want to see? That's why we're proposing a modification of the dashboard proposal to focus on six primary indicators and a host of sec secondary indicators seen here and attached to my testimony. Our teacher leaders will expand on these and also how we can tie them to support for our schools. Some suggest this conversation is only one for policy wonks or deep in the weeds or actually care about eliminating ratings and that this is about optics. That is insulting to the students I taught as, as an educator and those I served with whose work was demeaned by this rating whose school suffered as a result. Teaching at a neighborhood high school in DC, I heard my students mention all the time how their city ranked their school compared to their own experience. It was relentless, defeating and depressing. We don't have to send this message to our kids. The young people I taught deserve better. We have to reform the system and do so without delay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just testing to make sure everyone can actually hear me now. Excellent. Finally figured out the glitch. Um, thank you very much. Um, our next uh, panelist will be, I apologize, I am having to call a little bit out of order and I apologize for those watching at home. Um, but our next uh, witness is um, Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell, are you with us? Ms. Bell? Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Please go ahead. Um, uh, we, yes, good afternoon. Good evening. Time. Uh, my name is Regina Bell. I'm general vice president of the Washington Teachers Union. The current star rating system leans heavily on test scores and attendance to determine the school's transparency <clears throat> and reporting rating. The state board has already passed a resolution acknowledging that this summative rating star evaluation system is biased, especially against schools that serve large percentages of at-risk students. We believe the star rating does not tell the whole story of a school's performance and strongly support the board's efforts to elevate additional factors and eliminate the single summative rating given to schools in the current star rating system. Many schools in our underserved communities have chronic absenteeism, which results in a low rating. Students may have dropped out or enrolled elsewhere and school leaders, counselors, and teachers do a yeoman's work to re-engage these students. We know the principals and teachers do tremendous work to engage these students who often in our DCPS neighborhood schools have bounced from school to school throughout their academic careers. I don't see this work reflected in the evaluation system. DCPS has a teacher and substitute shortage and some days there aren't enough teachers in the building to do some, there aren't enough teachers in the building. So some principals have pitched in by substituting in classrooms. 
This impacts test scores as lessons may be missed, but yet schools are penalized despite not having the resources necessary to fulfill their educational mission. Rather, I prefer to see their work in building, in, in building community recognized in the system. Individual experiences vary. A student can have a great experience at school with a low rating, and you can have a terrible experience at a school with a high rating. It is important to have the system, the system it is important to have a system that recognizes and values the unique characteristic of each community school, while also recognizing our ultimate job is to help students succeed academically and graduate for college or careers. We agree with the State Board of Ed recommendation to adjust how dis the district measures or reports school quality so that the star rating minimizes underserved bias, undeserved bias against schools with large numbers of at-risk students. In conclusion, our schools are much more than a series of stars and the current school board evaluation, this current school evaluation system does, does a disservice to the, to the many dedicated employees of our city schools by trying to boil their work down to a single summative rating. Our city schools are not a product you can rate with a single score. They are living, breathing communities. They deserve nurturing and investment. And they, the students inside them are much more than a single score. Mr. Hayworth, are you online? President Parker, are you present? Yes, thank you. Um, I did step away and so I am not clear who is next to on the list. Uh, Ms. Parsons, have you had a chance to go? I have not actually, I'm in early, so I'm way, I'm supposed to be at the end of the list, but um, good evening. Um, thank you for having this discussion about the star rating system. My name is Susie Parsons and I'm a parent of a high schooler and a middle schooler that attend a charter school. A little bit about my journey in looking for schools for my children. When my eldest was ready to start in elementary school, there was not the My School DC common lottery, and I didn't know of a place where schools were rated. I read, heard about schools from articles or word of mouth. I worked with a friend to visit, houses, to visit open houses, rate schools based on what we learned. And at that time, curriculum and extracurricular activities were top on my priority list. I was interested in the school's culture, how they embraced not just the children by but the children's families. The aesthetics of the school were also important. Was there kids work on, on display? Was the facility well-maintained? Was there play space? Did it feel like a safe space? As my eldest grew, his learning style became a factor in what we were looking for in a school. In second grade, he was evaluated for an IEP. When looking for a different school to pique his interest in learning and to support his learning style, we evaluated schools based on their curriculum, extracurricular activities, classroom size, teacher student ratio, classroom management, teacher proficiency, student diversity, and student support services. When we started looking at middle schools for our son, the criteria we looked for in a school did not change much. We did add proximity to home or public transportation. For us, standardized testing was not a factor for us when looking for a school. I would now like to talk about standardized testing. I understand the value of standardized testing from the school's point of view, and I too am interested in knowing how my children are doing. However, I feel that there is too much emphasis being placed on the PARC test. Why are schools and teachers being evaluated on how their students are doing on a standardized test? Children in schools are stressed when it comes time for PARC testing. Valuable teaching time is taken because of the length of the test. Teachers cannot apply the information that they may learn about their students from the park test because the results are not available until the summer or the fall. How am I supposed to help my child if I don't receive the results in a timely manner? We as parents don't really get a breakdown 
of what they are tested on or suggestions on how to support our child if they're not doing well on a subject. From my experience, my children's charter schools, the NWEA MAP test provides immediate results to the child, school, and teacher for math and English. There are other tests that can utilize are there other tests that can utilize, be utilized for science and other subjects that schools would benefit from? Why aren't these tests being utilized in this way? My sons are not stressed when they are taking the, the MAP test. The school informs families when the students will be taking the test and asks that students get good rest, eat a good meal, but there is no pressure. With the PARC test, my oldest son's anxiety was heightened and some of it had to do with the pressure he felt that the school community was under. To reiterate, the things that I would like to see from the STAR rating system, curriculum and extra, extracurricular activities, the school's culture, classroom size, student-teacher ratio, classroom management, teacher proficiency, student diversity, and student support services. I would also- Ms. Add- Parsons, I apologize, we are out of, out of time, um, okay. and I do need to move to the next person. Um, Ms. Savage. I think we're on a race down the hall. Hold on one second. Um, Hi, sorry. Um, doing two things at once, but I promise I will go as fast as I can. <laughs> um, all right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carrie Savage, and I am the director of policy at PAVE. Thank you to all the State Board of Education representatives and staff for seeking out feedback from community experts and researchers to create recommendations for improvement on the STAR framework. After this issue was voted on as a top priority at the Parent Policy Summit in 2017 by PAVE parent leaders, PAVE hosted focus groups and surveyed 515 parents to determine what information about schools they most wanted to see. That work concluded that parents wanted information summarized in one place, are most interested in student performance by subgroup and teacher quality with re-enrollment school funding and attendance also rated highly. They're looking for a combination of quantitative or student achievements, suspension rates, et cetera, and qualitative information, specialized programming, after school programming, school culture. In July of 2018, we surveyed more parents on how they would use the report card with the top three responses being to choose a school for my children to better understand how a school is doing and the support a school would need and to learn more about the school program. You can see figure one in my full testimony. In every statement of beliefs that parents have written on their top issues, strong accountability across all of these areas is always a top priority. Parents have seen announcements about investments, initiatives, and plans, but too many are not seeing any differences in their own and their children's lived experiences. There are key themes that we've heard from families on what they want to see in an accountability system. Information on the school report card and all information shared with families should be accessible and in plain language. Presentation matters and prevents the tool from becoming overwhelming. Benchmarks are vital for parents to contextualize and interpret information. Accountability must be coupled with robust funding and supports and not just for schools in the lowest 5%. Accountability needs a strong focus on academics, but should not be limited to that. Parents are looking ahead and want information about 21st century learning experiences, especially in light of the persistence of COVID. They want to know what their kids will need to be ready for college and careers and what measures will help them determine if their students are on the right track. In particular, will this school effectively support my child's learning and social emotional development? How will this school work with parents and caregivers to support their kids developing socially, emotionally, and academic skills? What community partnerships and programs to help build life schools are available outside of the school day? Will this be a place where my child can find joy, explore their passions, and build a path for a fulfilling and productive life? What mental health supports are available to all kids and what's available for those with acute and intensive needs? Looking beyond attendance, how well are schools adjusting to the current environment when quarantining and virtual instruction? What about access technology, high, high quality Wi-Fi? What does in-person instruction versus virtual seat time look like at particular schools? I've included other concerns I've shared in my previous test in full testimony, but we'll highlight the need to take the following questions to families and educators to drive the answers. How do we assess and account for growth in high school? How do we allocate weights to show how well schools are supporting at-risk students with disabilities in each race group? 
and I, I'm so sorry. Um, I just last one, how do we represent a well-rounded educational experience? I hope Thank you me. consider these as part of your recommendations for Thank this accountability system. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Ms. Ritchie. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks so much to the board for your work and reevaluating the star rating system and proposing necessary changes. I am a Hardy Middle School parent and the secretary of the Ward 2 Education Council. From my perspective as a parent who recently moved to the district and relied on the star framework to make decisions about what neighborhood to move to, what school system to enroll in, I find that the star rating system as it currently operates serves to reproduce and exacerbate the challenges faced by schools with high populations of at-risk, disabled, English language learning students and students of color. The standardized data on which the rating system is based is so narrow and uncontextualized that it cannot possibly provide an adequate or complete picture of a school. Furthermore, Recent research, most notably by Dr. Jack Schneider of the University of Massachusetts Lowell, has shown that these scores do not truly measure school quality. Instead, they are more accurate reflections of social and economic status. This research has shown that far more telling measures of school quality come from climate and growth measures, such as teacher turnover rates, experience levels of educators, and school priorities. The single star rating system obscures these kind of insights about school quality and reduces our schools to rank ordered lists. Nevertheless, this faulty system codified in the star ratings is picked up by policy leaders, parents and guardians, and the general public and implemented as a measure of school quality, often without the use of any other information. Many busy families or families moving to the district from out, out of town uh, often rely only on the rating, nothing more. So the star rating system then inadvertently fuels a dynamic in which well-resourced families and caregivers considered low star ratings as an indication of a failing school, then flee that district, taking their resources with them. Therefore, I strongly urge the board to adopt the proposed measures to reformulate the evaluation process in particular, I support the proposal to summative rating and to implement the explanatory dashboard, which will provide a more well-rounded and contextualized picture of a school, its academic growth and climate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members of the board, we are now moving to questions. Each member will have two minutes for questions. Please use the raise your hand feature and I will call you in the order that I see you uh, listed. Our first up uh, will be Dr. Reed. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out and your well thought out um, points. Um, uh, Mr. Or quick, two quick questions. One, Mr. Goldstein, uh, vocational measurements were um, an element that was put on your example that you provided. Um, could you, or is, could you give us like what exactly would be vocational measurements? And then I, I am going to throw a question, another one. For um, it was often stated that students with disabilities do not currently show up very frequently in our um, current rating system. Um, and if anybody has ideas, which I think the parents that listed out uh, Ms. Parsons and uh, uh, Ms. Savage on behalf of parents have paid, um, but just kind of any key highlights about how to include students with disabilities more in the framework. So Mr. Goldstein and then anybody else. Yeah, I'll be quick. The extracurricular options and kind of a well-rounded education was very much part of it. There wasn't specifically, uh, I'm not sure where you're referring to, but uh, vocational programs, but I think that would absolutely be part potentially of, of uh, cur curricular offerings, which was very, very high on the list uh, from parents in our citywide survey. Um, yeah, and one of the six things that we thought should be prominent on a dashboard. Thank you. And then Ms. Parsons or any, anyone else about um, how children with disabilities show up in um, the, their performance show up in our, our report card. I think Carrie's the better person to ask that okay. question of. Ms. Savage, she might be running down the hallway again. <laughs> I might have to look at her testimony and reach out. Thank you. I don't want to hold up too much time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sutter. Thank you. And thank you to all who shared both the reasons that you have concerns about the existing star rating, as well as highlighting the many different things that you would like to see available um, when thinking about how to choose a school or how to assess the quality of our schools. 
One question I have is that in our recommendations, which are posted on our SBOE website for anyone watching in the public, we do note that we are going to include test score proficiency on the main dashboard, as well as test score growth. Um, and so I'm just curious from folks who specifically focused on their concerns about test scores, how you would respond to that. I'll go, I don't love it, but I accept that people want to see test scores. I would just hope that like maybe we have other things that are readily available, but I mean, I don't like park. I don't think, I think it's a waste of time. I'll just say that, you know, again, we surveyed 500 people with really equitable representation. The state board conducted many, many surveys on this, and we just didn't see um, widely. And I would say, especially when we looked at responses from Ward 7 and 8, test scores anywhere near the top of the list. And we've heard that again reflected from parents and testimony tonight. So I think a dashboard should make most prominent what people say they would like most prominent. Thank you both for that response. I'll, again, just note for the public, one of the reasons the STAR framework exists is because of the federal SM mandate that says that states must annually report uh, certain information each year about all schools in the district, and they have to break it down by student subgroup. And one of those elements is student test score proficiency. And another one of those elements um, is around academic growth. And so our current STAR framework does do both of those things. The new dashboard would have to include those things as well as use those things to calculate the bottom 5% of schools just to remain in compliance with federal law. Thanks all. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wattenberg. Um, thanks. Um, Mr. Hayworth, could you put up that part of the, um, uh, the recommendations that shows that draft framework, the draft dashboard, so people I, know what we're talking about? I don't have it directly available, but I can put it in the chat. If you can put it in the chat, why can't it go up? I guess I don't get that. I'm doing my best. Representative okay, Roberts. I appreciate it. If you, can, if you can put it up, because people in the outside can't see they can't see it. In fact, maybe Scott can Scott put it up because he had it, Mr. Goldstein, just so people can look at it. Well, I had I had a separate one that we share, which I'm happy to yeah, um, reshare fine. again. It's been disabled the screen sharing. Oh. Um, well, anyway, whoever can put it up, um, Mr. Hayworth, it would be great to have it uh, available because a lot of the comments. Uh, are relevant to it. So this was all great, guys. We have very little time to engage. So I want to um, put out, I'm going to put out one question last, but I, I, or I have two questions. One is, oh my, I was very interested in Ms. Savage's um, uh, testimony. And I'm part of what I hope will happen is, uh, Ms. Savage, when I look at these recommendations, uh, I see pretty much everything that you're proposing there in the re in the uh, recommendations that we have. Mr. Hayworth, if you could show the uh, the dashboard, the picture of that dashboard. Um, and I would be super interested in hearing from you, you know, offline, whatever, um, what if anything is not here um, that you need. One of your issues is to make sure that there's a funding um, that comes with it, which uh, I think we're all totally, totally for. I want to first go to um, uh, Ms. Fuchs on that, and then if there's time, come back to you. Ms. Fuchs, you raised the, the issue that the current STAR rating doesn't clarify what schools need. And part of what we were trying to do with this, with a dashboard like this, and let me just say this is just illustrative of the, of the recommendations um, that we've made. Part of what we really wanted to to be able to do is to show the kinds of issues that schools have, both the strengths and the needs so that school communities, as well as council members, whatever. Representative Wattenberg, okay. I apologize for interrupting. Your time has expired. Um, do you have a, a quick question that you can might be able to put in the chat? Um, yes, well, let me, um, can the witnesses respond in the chat? If they would like to, yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, I will it's just whether this you. would help with the funding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, John Paul. Um, thank you guys for coming. Uh, it, it's, I've, I've, I've heard like an iteration of this discussion over like many, many months now at many different public meetings. And it's nice to hear um, there's been a lot of consistency, I'd say, in what 
um, parents, what teachers, what um, policy advocates have really wanted. And I found uh, what you guys had to say really interesting. And, and there was one part of Mr. Goldstein's presentation that I think really, really hit me as something impactful about like the context of like what a rating is. Um, and I won't be there to vote on, um, on, on the recommendations we put forth in the January public meetings, so but I'll say this. I do think that we should eliminate um, a single summative rating um, of schools. And the reason is, I think oftentimes for parents, if you're making a very um, important decision, like where to send your child to school, I think it needs to be informed um, by a number of factors. And I think oftentimes, um, just from, from, from my experiences and from what I've heard throughout all these discussions is that there's a stigma that comes with a rating. And I can only imagine what that means for people who are looking at a school and they see it has a low rating. That may confuse them when they see it also has something that maybe they really valued. And so I think when we're considering what is it that a rating actually provides, I think in some cases it may actually make it harder for a parent to make a decision. And I'm not entirely sure it will actually make things easier that it provides any more context or actually contributes any more um, to a parent making that decision. I think it's important to have all the factors. And I think a rating, a summative rating may actually complicate um, what it is that a parent's priority might be. Um, but th thank you guys for, uh, for, for testifying here. Um, and that's my time. Thank you very much. Representative Thompson. I, I have a comment, uh, I, I guess, and a question, as a, and it's more of a check for understanding. Uh, I, what I have heard uh, is largely that the unhappiness, and I will say rightfully so, uh, is that the stars uh, mislabel and mischaracterize what is good in our schools. Now, that's what I understand, uh, that's what I believe. Uh, my question, I guess, and, and this is to anyone who would like to answer it, if the STAR formula, if, this, if a five-star school was a school and we labeled schools as five stars that were actually doing the beautiful things like we described as Garfield, if there was a formula that got us to labeling Garfield a five-star school, would you then be opposed to a summative? So is it the formula or is it the label? Uh, that's problematic. I go with both. Um, the way we're weighting things, I think, is problematic. But I do think that even if we had a better formula, that a summative rating is problematic. I would just emphasize again what I said about standards based grading, which is for students, there's no reason to take distinct skills and average them together. Right? That doesn't provide any meaningful feedback. And if you do so, we're just imposing our will on what we think should be weighted in a certain way, instead of allowing parents and families to decide what they think the weighting should be by just providing all the information to them. Is there an assumption baked in that we're not uh, elevating what parents and families agree is important? Uh, because, I, I, and I'm gonna just be honest about my bias. I think that if, if it was a perfect world, and we all had a shared definition of quality education uh, that was affirming uh, for marginalized communities, affirming for black students and people were doing the right thing by kids and that was labeled as five star, I would want to lift that up. And I would wanna make it real, really clear for people what that is. Uh, and so for me, it's a question of a formula uh, as opposed to just the label being bad. But so that's my comment. Thank, thank you very much, Representative Thompson. Uh, Vice President Gasoy. Thank you, and thank you all for your testimony. I wanted to thank, first of all, Ms. Parsons for being here for the first time, I believe. So welcome. And um, I wanted to also thank uh, Ms. Fuchs for raising up uh, what happened to Washington Met uh, in relation to um, overemphasizing uh, the, the factors that are on the star rating. So I, as you know, that was in my ward. It was something that I fought really hard for. And so I do want to um, keep that memory fresh. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and I just wanted to say that everything that was said really resonated with me, including um, Representative O'Sullivan's remarks. 
Um, Ms. Lake, I just wanted to ask you, you brought up several times in the context of the star rating that you have been, you know, just feeling a lot of stress and even considering leaving. And I know that schools are not going to be rated this school year, mm -hmm. but I was just wondering if that's, if those are two separate things, I just wanted to clarify clarity from you sort of if there is a direct connection between your feelings of wanting to leave the classroom and, and the star rating. Yes, I want to leave the classroom because it's no longer fun for me as a teacher. My children are not finding joy. I find myself oftentimes not teaching and exposing them because their English and math teachers have so much pressure on them. And I'm like, okay, let me make sure that I'm supporting you over here. And then I'm not exposing them to things that I know that are also going to build them, you know, like they're going to build their global citizenship, their global connections, their exposure. If we are really aiming for equitable education, we need to make sure we um, talk to children and teach them in a holistic manner, not only focusing on the start uh, rating and this testing. This is a learning. You're, you're building robots. We're not Thank building you. children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lake. Um, seeing no additional questions from, from members, um, we can dismiss this panel. Thank you so much for being here. And we do have the, our next panel ready to go. Um, our first panel um, is going to be, our first panelist will be um, Ms. Harper. Ms. Harper, you can begin when you when you would like, and you have three minutes. Okay, hi. Can I, am I heard clearly? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. How is everyone? My name is Nisa Harper. I'm a Ward 8 <laughs> resident, a mom of four, and I have a third grader at Ketchum Elementary School. And the reason I'm on this uh, Zoom tonight is because my son has been experiencing bullying and harassment at the school. And I've had from several students, whereas the school had to put in a safety plan for my son. And I had to start seeing the uh, mental health specialist to help with his mental health. Um, I'm very disappointed, I'm very upset. He got hit in the chair, I mean, in the head with a chair two days ago. Um, there are several incidents within my three minutes that I'm going to discuss. One is uh, there is not Ms. Harper, I believe we may have lost your audio. Um, Ms. Harper, can you hear me? A lot of, it seems a lot of teachers and educators are not clear on when to file an incident report and who should file it. I've had several incidents of that. I have been in contact with my Ward 8 representative for the school board, Dr. Reed, and some other advocates. Um, I think there needs to be other training. And like I said, I'm very concerned about my son's safety. I am looking for an emergency safety transfer plan for my son. Um, he's been assaulted, he's been bullied. And that is why I'm on this call. I wanted to, before I do other means, I wanted to Ms. Harper, can you hear us? Students, once my son is gone, because I'm going to advocate for him. So um, that's basically what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for being here. Um, we will follow up with you uh, offline. Um, our next uh, panelist will be Ms. Riley. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, it's my understanding that you hope to vote on your recommendation to ASI regarding the school report cards in January. From the accountability and assessment committee documents, it appears there's still some disagreement on the use of a summative rating and on the way you will identify the 5% eligible for more extensive support. 
I strongly urge you to embrace a dashboard approach to the report card and to reject a summative rating, which would be the continued use of the STARS or something similar. The educational experience of students and families in our schools, in our DC schools, is far greater than the sum of the measured parts. The dashboard gives a better picture of a school. There's also room to add some context in some of the boxes. So, and I also, I support the expansion to six main areas as recommended by Empower Ed on the front page. The stars have been a distraction and by anointing some schools as excellent five star and others as bad one star, they have amplified a perception of status and thus incentivized more mobility as families strive to do the best for their children by enrolling them in schools that appear better. While taking away the star rating will not remove this, the dashboard will promote a longer and more thorough look at, at a school that perhaps involves less travel time or one that may offer specific programs and actually be a better match for their family. It will also hopefully remove the focus on test taking and test scores. The instruments and the ways we measure are all far from perfect or accurate. Whether it is the PARC or IB or AP, they are all tests, which are limited indicators of academic proficiency and growth. They are important as one lens, but not more than that. All of the measures are limited, even surveys, but together they can give a greater and far more fair picture. Please do not continue to reduce the complicated experience of providing an education, which is a joint effort of family and school to a single indicator. In reviewing the document from the Accountability and Assessment Committee, the board has more work to do on the way to identify the 5% of schools that will be receive more help. I'm most familiar with the high schools and I don't think the metrics are right. I'm just seeing this, so I'd like to give you further input before your January meeting. I'd also like you to reconsider the requirement for the quality school review. We did this under Michelle Ree and it was my experience they were not nearly as helpful as you are envisioning. How about a strength-based approach? What was successful at that time and even since was a coming together of a representative school group like an LSAT or some group like that with lots of check-ins with the larger community to gain engage in a process of improvement with support from professionals with particular areas of expertise. This is such important work. Your vote really matters here. It's a heavy responsibility and I appreciate you taking it on and all the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Norton. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My name is Cody Norton. I'm a DCPS teacher in Ward 1 and a Ward 4 resident. I'm testifying tonight to recommend that we remove the single summative score from the rating system in favor of a comprehensive dashboard model. The current framework champions schools for receiving four or five stars as a de designation, but these ratings don't always mean a school is a safe or welcoming space for students, families, and teachers, especially marginalized groups like the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. Dashboard models allow schools to highlight important factors like family, teacher, and student satisfaction that have the capacity to prioritize the perspectives of those furthest from opportunity and that may not be effectively captured by a single score. I came to DC in 2011 to start my teaching career, and I made the decision that I would be openly gay with students, families, and colleagues, because that was the representation I desperately needed but never had as a student. At my first school, I had to endure heterosexism and rampant homophobia that denied my existence and actively tried to suppress who I was. This narrative was true for other LGBTQ staff members and families. Despite rampant student, teacher, and family turnover, these experiences were largely ignored and overshadowed because the school was lauded as a high achieving, no excuses environment. School satisfaction aimed at building safe welcoming spaces wasn't a priority. I planned on quitting teaching, but a principal convinced me to come to their school and there I was welcomed. Students, teachers, and families were encouraged to be their whole authentic selves. A few years ago, families attended a back to school night in my third grade classroom. An older sister of a student approached me and thanked me for the impression that I'd made. She identified as a lesbian, and when she came out to her younger sibling in my class, she was met with shock and confusion. After the student enrolled in my class, they came home to excitedly tell their sister that their teacher, Mr. Norton, was openly gay, and he even, even had a picture of his husband on his desk. The sister explained how her sibling finally understood and loved that part of her, 
and how fortunate it was that in my classroom and school, we discussed issues of identity, gender, and sexual orientation in a way that was open and uplifting because that wasn't her school experience. This anecdote is one of many that represents the kind of student satisfaction that has led to nearly 100% re-enrollment of my students year after year, the kind of family satisfaction that has led parents with younger children to give their kids a countdown until they're finally in my class, and teacher satisfaction, which has led me to stay at this school for nine years. It represents the values of centering community, even when systemic inequality continues to deny schools access to the necessary resources to thrive unencumbered. I call on all members of the SBOE, particularly the LGBTQ members of the board, to promote a dashboard model that centers the needs and voices that are most often ignored, erased, and left behind. Some may say that these changes are just for optics, but I don't see optics in wanting to build a school model that centers on marginalized voices and uses those perspectives as a focus for how to create a liberating, welcoming environment. I just see humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Bachelor, welcome back. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth, uh, and thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, first, I, I want to say Godspeed to one of my favorite former colleagues, uh, Mr. O'Sullivan, whose last meeting is today. I want to thank the board for their continued determination to listen to the voices of our families and educators to improve this evaluation system. Uh, I'm proud to have served alongside many of you to share in this necessary engagement and push for the right balance in this score. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to come today to uh, say that I support the recommendations of the Committee on Accountability and Assessment to right size the framework and make sure that uh, it more, is, it's more closely tied to direct support for our schools. I wanted to just take the couple minutes that I had uh, to touch on two points. One uh, is, uh, and both clearly are <clears throat> things that we've been hearing for the past half decade from stakeholders, especially stakeholders uh, in Ward 8 uh, about this score. Uh, the first is that um, measuring inputs influences practice and Ward 8 residents have demanded in public meetings uh, to focus far less on test scores and about the inputs that create nurturing and successful school communities. Uh, they include school climate measures uh, about how students feel safe, challenged and loved, teacher retention, diversity and experience and well-rounded education. Uh, but the second point uh, is, is my more pointed one, uh, and it is about supporting the elimination uh, of the summative rating. Uh, I'm in support of the Reed Weidenberg proposal to eliminate the summative rating. Um, and, uh, and I think it has done uh, the harm that we thought it would uh, when we predicted this back in 2017. Uh, we know that choosing the best school for the development of the whole child isn't as simple as choosing a good restaurant to go to tonight, and it shouldn't be treated uh, that way. There's so much nuance, uh, but the stars don't require nuance. Uh, we say don't judge a book by its cover, and then we put a very bold and uninformed judgment on the schools that need most uh, to tell their stories in a fuller way. Uh, Ms. Ms. Fuchs said it best earlier uh, in the meeting that schools are human institutions and community institutions. And we've made the work for those humans inside our schools, school leaders, educators, and concerned community members harder to restore the faith uh, in our schools by not measuring the critical inputs, but, but by really uh, measuring very narrow outputs that don't tell the full story uh, of their school communities. Um, <clears throat> As the representative of many of these schools during the first years of implementation, I watch school leaders uh, struggle to really build the confidence that their families and communities really require to invest in the school system. And I know that we can do better if we give schools an opportunity through a framework uh, outside of the summit of writing to tell that story and to do that work. So thanks so much, colleagues. And it's great to be back. I'm sorry for my voice. I'm recovering from COVID. So thank you. We're glad to hear you're on the mend. Uh, Mr. Simon. Thank you, uh, Representative Parker. Um, and thank you board for working to fix the school rating system. The overly simplistic star rating is doing damage. Uh, it rates schools not on the range of measures that represent school quality, but rather on measures that far too much reflect the demographic background and relative privilege of students. 
research has found that school factors only explain about 20% of standardized test scores, which determines 70% of the star rating. Family background characteristics are three times as determining of test scores. It creates a self-fulfilling prophecy advantaging schools with wealthier, whiter students and stigmatizing schools in higher poverty neighborhoods. And just to address uh, uh, Member Thompson's questions about uh, a, a summary uh, rating at all, if you have a summary rating, a summative rating with the, the federal uh, requirements on standardized test scores, test scores will always be, dr be driving um, that summative rating. Don't get me wrong, test scores can be useful, but they must not be overemphasized and uh, they must not be a judgment on the quality of the school, which they are not. Um, according to Jack Schneider, an expert on these choices about school rating systems, public perceptions of schools actually improve when people have a wide array of performance data rather than primarily standardized test scores and simple summative ratings. So I wanna applaud the state board, uh, the Committee on Accountability and Assessment for its recommendations, which I agree with. Uh, number one, eliminate the single rating. Parents are not idiots and don't need a movie rating style star rating system that distorts what's going on in a school. They need a dashboard with factors that parents actually look for, including measures of what parents, students, and teachers think of the school, evidence of professional culture and teaching quality, staff turnover, growth metrics on standardized tests, and measures of the quality and range of academics offered. Um, number two, of course, school climate, academic growth, equitable growth, and academic proficiency should be on the dashboard. But some of the factors you include as secondary uh, are actually hugely important. And I go into that in my, test in my uh, written testimony and, um, and I address each of the recommendations, which all of which I support. So in short, I wanna say bravo to the board. <laughs> Uh, your work has opened the door to a much healthier era of measuring the quality of our schools. Thank you very much, Mr. Summit. I apologize. I do have to cut you off yeah, okay. um, because we do have uh, uh, an, another witness as well. Uh, President Pogue Lyons, uh, you have three minutes. Good evening and thank you. I am Jacqueline Pogue Lyons, president of the Washington Teachers Union. I've taught in uh, DC public schools across the district for over 28 years. My last teaching assignment was as a kindergarten teacher at Savoy Elementary School. As president of the WTU, I am committed to fighting for social and educational justice for the students of the District of Columbia, as well as for the well-being of district teachers. COVID-19 and the subsequent school closures have made clear that schools play an outsized role in our community. I'm extremely proud of the countless hours that educators and school employees put in over the past two years, creating lesson plans for virtual for the virtual environment, advocating for their students to get the computers and the internet access they needed to attend class, even delivering meals for students and their families and ensuring that we follow health and safety protocols as we've welcomed students back to in-person learning and they've given so much more. In short, our schools are much more than a series of stars and the current school evaluation system does a disservice to the many dedicated employees of our city schools by trying to boil their work down to a single summative rating. Our city schools are not a product that, can, that you can rate on Amazon or Yelp. They are living, breathing communities. They deserve nurturing and investment. And they and the students inside them are much more than a single score. I wanna thank the State Board of Education for leading the debate about ways to improve our schools and our, our city schools accountability framework. 
over the past several years, the state board and its members have been the voice of parents and communities, injecting new ideas and insights into the problems that are facing our schools and our students. You've brought our cities high rates of teacher turnover to the public's attention. You stood in opposition to the closure of Washington Metropolitan High School. You stood with our parents and students in demanding DCPS meet its commitment to ensure one-to-one -one computer ratios for schools. Tonight's discussion is no different. The state board and your committee on accountability and assessment have brought for 12 solid recommendations to improve the school transparency and reporting star framework and improve the framework's connection to local schools. Since 10 of the 12 recommendations were adopted unanimously, I'll focus my remaining remarks on the two recommendations that received split votes. First, the Washington Teachers Union supports the elimination of the single summative rating of schools. Again, our schools are rich, diverse communities and they deserve much more than a single star rating. While anecdotal, I've heard many parents who dismiss schools that have any less than four stars, refusing to even consider the school for their child. President Pogue Lyons, I do apologize for interrupting. Um, please do put your uh, second recommendation in the chat if you're able. Yeah. Members, we are now moving to question rounds. If you yeah. have questions, please, uh, do you use the raise your hand feature and we will get to you in the order that you raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you, President Polk Lyons. We really Thank appreciate you. it. Uh, Dr. Reed, we'll begin with you. Yes, I just wanted um, Ms. Harper to have a quick opportunity to um, summarize some of her recommendations and questions. Ms. Harper, can you hear me? There we go. It's shaky. You might have to come off camera. No. Yes, you can put it in the chat. Thank you. I, I yield. Thank you, uh, Representative Reed. And thank you, Ms. Harper. Um, yes, if you can put your comments in the chat, that would be very helpful. Um, Mr. O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, John Paul. And President Pogue Lyons, I was going to uh, yield the rest of my time to you uh, so you can provide your uh, the, the rest of your remarks. But before I do that, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, well, not Vice President Bachelor, but uh, Mr. Bachelor Marcus uh, for those comments. Really nice to see you. Um, and thanks to each of you guys who, who joined here today. But um, President Pogue Lyons, you can uh, take the rest of my time. Thank you so much. I hope I don't use the time to get off mute, but I was going to also add that the current star system is heavily weighted toward test scores. In my work with the WTU and previously as a teacher, I've seen schools prepare for park. They hold prep rallies, host ice cream socials, and do all types of things to get students excited to take the test. In the weeks leading up to park, many schools go into test prep mode ending new instruction and canceling enriching learning opportunities to drill and test their students. Yes, the test results are important, but they fail to capture the whole child experience. Again, schools are communities where we're responsible for the social, emotional, and the physical health of our students, as well as their test scores. The star rating should reflect this. So thank you. And I'll uh, thank you for giving me your extra time. I really appreciate it. Of course. And I'll also, uh, I'll also say um, thank you, Ms. Harper, for uh, sharing um, what's happening to your son. That's definitely an issue uh, I, I particularly as a student um, really, uh, really care about. And just thank you so much for sharing that. And we're all hoping for the best. And I hope we as a board can support you the best that we can. Thank you, Mr. O'Sullivan. Uh, Dr. O'Leary. I'd just like to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, star rating. We, when I was uh, at Cadozo forever, we uh, knew that when the star rating was gonna come that Cadozo was gonna be a one-star school because of the weight of the park test. And um, there wasn't a doubt that we were doing what we were supposed to be doing in Cadozo 
to help all of the students in the school, but we were gonna be labeled that way. And as an AP teacher, you know, probably the biggest standardized test as far as uh, what you're supposed to know that's given to high school students. And I'm all for, I'm an AP person, but I also know that the park test was not taken seriously by the students at all. And somebody mentioned earlier today about how the results of the park test don't even come back until after the end of school, which makes absolutely no sense at all. Now the AP test comes back after school is out, but it's, a, it's not used as far as what your grade is gonna be. And it's not used as far as what's gonna happen with the teachers. And the teachers were uh, impacted by their star rating and they were impacted by the park test. And so I am totally against the park test a, and against the star rating B. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. Uh, Representative Wattenberg. Hi, thanks to everybody for coming. I just wanna raise one thing that is really for the good of the order um, and is really to, um, to, to the state board. I find having seven people on a panel and then two min minutes per person, it makes it really, really difficult to engage with the people who have taken the time to come to us. So I hope we will rethink that. I understand that people want to go home and all that, but I, I hope we'll rethink that. Um, my question um, to everybody is one of the, again, John Paul, could you put up, Mr. Hayworth, could you put up that picture? So I do want to refer to it. One um, part of what we tried to do again in our recommendations and this picture sort of tries to capture it um, is to provide an easy way for people to see the kinds of information um, that parents really that parents really want when they're making choices, but also that school communities really need in order to have conversations as school communities advocate for what they need, focus in the way they they focus. One of the a number of these issues have been talked about tonight. One of the sort of secondary indicators that I also would hope would be much bigger is this resources slash programs. And I wonder if people could just you know very quickly uh, say what they would like to see in there as just an example, some of the things that we have heard in different engagements and in our um, surveys or things like, does it have a NAF Academy? Uh, does it have advanced classes? Uh, what's the ratio of counselors or social workers to the students? Um, does it have before and after care? Uh, what, what languages does it teach? Um, you know, uh, what's, you know, how many reading interventionists does it have in comparison to the students uh, who need it, et cetera? Uh, floor goes anybody who jumps in with an idea. For resources that we would want to include and make very clear uh, on that report, on that uh, dashboard. I think that's, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, Ruth, I think you named everything that people would like to see. I don't, um, I can't add to it, especially when I think about the fact that you go to many schools now um, in certain neighborhoods where they just have Spanish, which, um, you know, very rarely now in certain neighborhoods where you, fi you find that they offer both Spanish, French, and another language like Chinese. Those are all things that I feel are important to offer at schools. And many times when you go to certain communities, French is offered over a laptop. President okay. Poulence, thank you so much thank for, for thank I, you. I do apologize. Yep. If, I, if, other, if other pub, public witnesses would like to um, answer Representative Wattenberg in the chat, we'd certainly encourage that. Representative Thompson. Good evening. I'm actually going to pose a similar question to what I posed last time to everyone except for Mr. Simon, only because he already gave his point of view and I want to hear from more people. Uh, I am genuinely curious. Is the issue uh, more the formula, like what we are measuring as school quality, because I've heard over and over from people, test scores isn't it, the weight of test scores isn't it, uh, or is it solely the labeling? Uh, because if we were labeling the right things, would that be bad? Or like, is it the formula or is it the label? Or is it both? Tell me, but. Uh, Representative Thompson, I think it's really both. I think in the formula, you have prioritized certain things. 
I think, as you've heard from people, there is a place for the test, but it is an outsized presence in the way we do things. So I think for all of us, I mean, I don't know, for, for many people I've spoken to, uh, the tests are not as important. And if we could do a different test, and if we could measure students' growth from when they came in that year and when they, when they at the end of the year, that might be valuable. But still, it's just a test. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's both. I also agree uh, that, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Cody. Thank you. I also agree that it would be both. Um, so from my perspective, who's to say that the way that you would weight and label schools is not in and of itself inequitable based on your perspective? Um, you know, we all have areas of <laughs> our schema or identity that we might miss. Um, so like, you know, it's very hard to divorce inequity from any label that you're trying to ascribe to a school rating system. I'll just say very quickly, I think uh, Representative O'Sullivan put it well. It's, it's just a more complicated decision than, than a star rating. I think whether a, a school has one star um, and, and families are making decisions based on that one star, they have five stars and we're missing those things um, in which schools can do better for students at the margins. I think we missed that conversation with the summative rating. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Parker, or excuse me, President Parker. Yes, thank you uh, all for sharing a few things and then I wanna to get to the question. So what we know, the rating is biased uh, and we can see that as it follows all of the city's trends where boards 875 tend to be where uh, the lowest ranked schools are. What we know is that parents aren't really informed about the star rating. Uh, what we know is that uh, Professor Reardon from Stanford's uh, groundbreaking research tells us that schools that uh, seem to perform low actually sometimes chart the highest level of growth for example, in Chicago schools. Um, and what we know is that rapid gentrification and displacement is happening across our city. So what I'm getting at is this. Um, what troubles me is that there is an absence of conversation around supporting our schools. What we also know is that we are not doing well by all of our students. Uh, and while we can debate whether or not to keep a summative or get rid of it, what I'm not hearing nearly enough is then what are we going, going to do next? How are we going to support our schools and, and improve them? One thing I would point to Massachusetts, which has a, a robust uh, support, school support system, ties their accountability summative rating to support. So the question I would provide to you in my last few seconds is how do we, whatever you your opinion is, bake in support for our schools so that we're doing right by kids? Uh, Mr. Simon, President Lyons, Mr. Bachelor, anybody, go for it. Quickly, I like what you said. We should also rate growth, like you said, in Chicago. That's a, another way that we can tell how schools are improving. But Not let me push there. I, no disrespect. But no. Uh, so let's say we have a dashboard. Then what do we do? How do we then assess schools to provide support for LEAs as a city? And I will say we're not doing that now, which is also a big concern of mine. That also means that you have to have a comprehensive education program. And so the comprehension, the comprehensive education program would be able to chart growth and not just scores on a test, which is what people are using. Because I will say as someone that taught at Savoy, I was very good at growth for my students, especially when you think about where my students came in and where they went by the end of the year. But if you're talking about whether a kindergartner is going to be on a second grade level, maybe not. But if you think where that kindergartner came in and where I took them to a first grade level, that's growth. Thank you. That is my time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other uh, questions from members, this panel is dismissed. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Um, if we do have additional questions, we will certainly follow up with you. Um, our next panel will begin with uh, Maya Baum. Hi, good evening. 
My name is Maya Baum. I'm a fourth grade teacher at a Ward 2 school. This is my seventh year teaching in DC and my eighth year teaching overall. I've been coming to the state board meetings for almost a year now, testifying about the harmful effects of the current STAR framework and the need to move away from a summative rating to a more holistic dashboard model for our schools. So tonight, I'm going to move away from solely my perspective and share with you all the perspectives of my fourth graders. So earlier this week, I gave my students a series of questions. Do you enjoy going to school? What makes you feel this way? Are you happy at school? Is your school a good place to learn? And finally, how would you feel if people who do not go to your school said your school was not a good place to learn? I did not tell them until after what these questions were for and full disclosure, they're really excited that their thoughts are being included in public testimony. Um, most students said that they enjoy school and feel happy about their school, primarily because of their friends. When asked how they would feel if others said their school was not a good place to learn, here are some of their responses. I would feel sad, mad, upset. I would tell them to come visit the school because they don't know. I would tell them to visit it themselves so they can see. I would ignore them. I would tell them that's not a kind thing to say. Evaluate schools should not just focus on what fourth graders judge a good school to be. Their views show something really important, that all schools matter to the children and communities they serve. Having a system that is largely based on test scores and attendance that tells students and families that their school is good or bad is harmful, but it, because it ignores all the other aspects that make a school and seeing the whole child. It punishes schools and thus families. When schools are deemed as one or two stars or even three, it sends a message to the families and students that they do not belong in education. And I would say that that is true for any type of rating, regardless of the measurement. And I know that this is the message because I work in schools and I talk constantly with families. And we are in a crisis right now that hasn't even reached its peak. Families don't trust our school system. Teachers are tired of being ignored, silenced, and disrespected and are leaving the profession. And you may not realize this, but this framework is aiding that crisis. Teachers are tired of being punished by a system that does not support them and that ignores all the work and good teaching they do. A system that requires schools to focus solely on producing good test scores, creating a culture of stress, disengagement, and poor teaching. Teaching for a test is not fun or creative. Teachers are leaving the profession, and I'm saying it again because we do not have schools without teachers. The public has been coming to these meetings for months and months now, providing research, personal experiences, and stories from communities about the harm this rating system causes to our city and the need to move away from it. Not modify it, change it. Not become less biased, but to be not biased. This is the time to be on the side of the real stakeholders in education, teachers, students, and families. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mullings. Leaders who do not listen cultivate communities that stop speaking. Good evening. I'm Raymond Mullings, an Empower Ed Equity Fellow. I am a teacher and administrator. Six months ago, almost to this day, I engaged in, in this space and spoke about the danger of a single story. I spoke about what you may see when you look at me as a Black man and the things you cannot possibly know at first glance. I am neither more Black or more gay or more disabled. I am more complex and layered than any one aspect of my identity. Schools are much the same. In a five-star school, we may see high test scores and remarkable growth, high attendance and impressive re-enrollment rates, yet, a five star, yet five stars does not tell us if families are satisfied, if the school is safe, or how well the school is retaining well-qualified educators. DC families care more about these metrics. How do I know? Because I helped survey them. School culture and climate, family and student satisfaction, specialized academic programs, student safety and staff retention were identified as more valid and important ways of measuring a school, according to the 500 DC residents who engage with us. Out of the 26 metrics included, high standardized scores ranked 25th out of 26. Yes, DC families across all eight wards reported that high standardized scores ranked second to last. Yet here we are offering stars and not support. This has to change. We need a dashboard to make these metrics transparent and visible. The strength of our communities require it, our schools need it, our students will benefit from it, and our families are advocating for it. As community leaders and practitioners, we have a duty to show up for them, for the next generation of leaders and learners who will stand on our shoulders and take the city forward. In June, I shared the truth that standardized testing is inherently racist. As a city, we add to this harm by solely focusing on stars and scores. We assume that high test scores are greater than teamwork. We assume that enrollment means more than empathy. We assume that attendance is more important than celebrating diversity. And we assume that growth is greater than curiosity and questioning. Today's educator seeks to develop the whole child, 
not just their brain. Let, let us not assume communities see their children as test scores and not people. Let us not assume that we know what families need better than they do. Let us not assume that it is okay to make decisions for families and disregard their needs. I recognize that there are individuals whose viewpoints seek to call these efforts mere optics or non-substantive. I wanna be very clear here. Removing the star rating, which we acknowledge as bias, exacerbates school segregation and drives inequities is one of many steps we must take. It's not the only step. The star rating hasn't been effective at improving school performance at large because school improvement doesn't happen without true and city support to schools who are struggling with unique and nuanced challenges. I wholeheartedly agree that we need an overhaul of our educational systems. Our nation is entrenched with laws born out of white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal culture that institutionally and systemically perpetuate inequities across lines of difference. Oppression and inequity in our country occurs by design. It is not by chance. Removing the star rating framework is an active step to counter the bias that this board recognized in a resolution adopted September 16th of last year. So what's the point you ask? Will these recommendations do any real good? That in part is for the community to answer and the data shows that they already have. Many thanks to each and every soul who is here sharing space and time with me tonight. Thank you very much. Dr. Wolf. Hello, good evening. My name is Betsy Wolf. I'm a quantitative education researcher by day and a DCPS parent by night. I've been raising the alarm bells on the way that Aussie has rated school quality for years now. I send two of my three children to a two-star school. Why do I do such a thing, you might ask? because Aussie school ratings have little to do with school quality and the whole school rating system is a sham. School quality is defined by what the school does to improve student learning or well-being more generally. To measure school quality, there has to be some accounting for where students started out when they entered the school. If there is not, then you're essentially measuring the cumulative educational opportunities the child has ever experienced in their lives, including healthcare, extracurricular experiences, parental education, and so on. In other words, you're measuring school quality plus a bunch of other things that might matter more than school quality. Why do we do this? Well, it's easier to put bad labels on schools serving underserved populations and blame school staffs than it is to equitably invest resources, including our own time, into these schools. If we rate these schools poorly, then we also don't have to feel bad about opting out of them and sending our children elsewhere to a good school. To the extent that school quality is based on proficiency rates, DC is complicit in the system. There has to be an accounting of where students begin or else we're not talking about school quality. I'm not advocating for hiding percent for proficiency. I think those metrics should be publicly available, but we cannot say in good faith, school quality and a half proficiency be an indicator. We could call it cumulative educational opportunities since birth. And it makes sense to invest more resources in schools serving children who have had fewer opportunities since birth but we should also not punish those schools automatically without any regard for what the schools are actually doing. Other things, we probably need a better growth metric in DC. The correlation between the growth metric and student demographics should be close to zero and it's not. We also might need to use multi-year averages of growth metrics if they're wildly unstable and fluctuate from year to year. Two, we have to be careful that some of the other indicators such as re-enrollment and attendance are measuring what schools are actually doing as opposed to things like housing instability. Three, measuring school environment by attendance and disciplinary measures is just sad, we can do better. Number four, four years ago, I found that demographics explained about 62% of the variation in DC school ratings. That means our rating system is more about measuring who does the school serve as opposed to what is the school doing. Let's do better DC. Let's not present misleading information about school quality and instead provide parents and guardians with information that is actually useful in selecting the school for their children. When I was checking out schools for my kids, I had to observe a class because I otherwise didn't have the information that I needed. And most people can't take the time off work to do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Kreiner Brown. Okay, can you all see and hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Allison Kreiner Brown and I am uh, the parent of two DCPS students um, at a two-star school. I'm a former member of the State Board of Education as a task force, a uh, member of the Ward 7 Ed Council, Ward 8 Ed Council. As many of you know, I've done uh, a lot of organizing with parents across the city for more than a decade across schools, across wards, working with families who uh, in particular were 
who I think we have in mind when we say that parents need something they can easily see and make sense of. Um, that said, as a parent, I'm going to give my perspective mostly as a parent, in part because Betsy and many other people uh, can speak to why the STARS and why the, the standardized testing is problematic. Uh, so one, down with the single summative score, up with the dashboard, um, a lot of parents and families really are using the STARS as Yelp ratings. And uh, I know some of you have heard me say this. I'll say it again here for the record. I talked to a parent at our daycare for the youngest child. Uh, who knew that we were at our school. And when I talked to him, he said when they were looking for pre-K three, his wife completely took our school out of consideration, even though it's their neighborhood school because of the star ratings. Here's something that's interesting about the star ratings that I think a lot of parents don't know. So for one, we haven't had them for several years. So my school was rated two stars several years ago. Has a lot fundamentally changed? There's been a pandemic, but when we're talking about accountability, has a lot fundamentally changed because the stars are not there? I do see they're not on my school DC and some of the other places. And yes, now is the time to re-envision and reimagine. Number two, um, I'm the parent of a second grader. We have been at the school for five years. The park test is still the majority at the elementary level of the rating. We haven't even got, we've been at the school for five years and haven't even gotten to a grade that does park testing. A lot of parents don't realize that. The pre-K measure is, well, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, another point that I wanna emphasize is the pandemic. We are on a new trajectory now. This is not, how do we just get back on track? We are on a new trajectory with where we need to go for actually meeting the needs of students, and I will also say supporting the educators who guide them. And because we already know there is bias in standardized testing and in single sum rating summative systems like the STARS, here's one of my questions. If we continue on the path where we are both for the STARS and the high emphasis and high stakes testing, what will these tests truly be measuring? What are the STARS truly measuring and what are the implications of that, especially coming out of the pandemic? Also on the accountability, let's, we need to look at inputs and other things. Are we holding schools accountable for the mental health supports? I have a lot more I will say, but I wanna just end by saying thank you, Alex, for your service. Um, teacher retention, I'm afraid that we are in a crisis and also COVID cases are rising in school and we need to not ignore that. Thank you for my time. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. DuBose. Good evening. There is such great credible evidence shared tonight to support changing the school rating system. I am Gabrielle DeBose, a DC high school teacher and a board member of Empower Ed. Tonight I'm expressing my concerns about the widely known fact that the STAR framework is grossly unfair. The current framework is an idea that began on paper with the pretense of bringing equity across all eight wards in, wards in the district, but that really did not come to fruition. The STAR system is a negative construct that gains strength and momentum because affluent families with greater resources adhere to and rely upon the misguided STAR data and take flight, leaving needy schools exposed to greater inequity. It is this flawed system that broadens the vulnerability gap for deserving students by focusing strictly on test scores rather than considering the school's quality that seeks to build the whole child creating a holistic dashboard feature with an array of schools offering strengths such as their academic success, cultural significance, culturally relevant uh, curriculum should be prominently featured for parents to consider. Parents can critically think through that information to decide. Instead, families now rely on these ratings, 70% of the star rating for elementary and middle schools and 40% of the star rating for high schools based on standardized test scores to decide where to move their children. Research supports that the standardized tests are biased. Thus, the ratings reflect biases based on race, class, and neighborhood, not the strength of the school. Often these families go where they can control the narrative, hold resources hostage at their school of choice, and ultimately receive the biggest benefit of public school education for their children. Unless all DC families and supports of public school education uh, pay attention and are informed about how the STAR framework is used to divide and conquer, they remain unaware that our most unguarded children and schools who experience unfair practices will see equity fading fast, almost unattainable. 
With the current STAR framework rating of public schools in D.C. as families visit sites to review schools, the prominent racial bias information at the top of the page tells privileged parents all they need to know. Parents who subscribe to creating their own world will continue to flock to schools where they can control the narrative rather than trusting qualified educators and school officials to teach, reach, and advance their children. The solution is simple, but it takes tough decisions. And then standing firm with those decisions to establish an equitable dashboard where all DC schools, especially those who are historically left out, can benefit and grow. President Biden's Build Back Better bill is a great example of moving legislation forward to get something done that's been virtually non-existent in this country where those historically left out of fair opportunities will benefit. His BBB bill and the revision of the STAR framework are both pathways leading to good trouble our dear John Lewis lived to talk about. Imagine his response to a dashboard highlighting school quality versus biased scores or ratings. Ms. Duval, honor I, of I apologize. Your, your time has expired. If you can make sure to send us the written testimony so we have the full record, we really would appreciate it. Um, Ms. Coffin. Uh, thank you. Good evening, members of the D.C. State Board of Education. My name is Chelsea Coffin, and I'm the director of the Education Policy Initiative at the D.C. Policy Center. I'm testifying tonight on the Committee on Accountability and Assessments recommendations to follow up on Resolution SR-2011. I will focus my comments on Recommendations 1 and 12. First, I was so glad to see Recommendation 12, which suggests in including an indicator for employment, career readiness, and college graduation. Understanding more about district graduates' experiences in early career could inform practices and investments to support current students and future graduates on a path to success. The DC Policy Center's recent report, Measuring Early Career Outcomes in DC, presented a blueprint of how the District of Columbia can collect more information on the early career outcomes of former public school students. Although finding these data is incredibly challenging, it is critical in order to find out what happens to public school students after their 15 years of pre-kindergarten to grade 12 school. Including early career outcomes in OSSE's longitudinal data system as recommended is essential to tracking them consistently for all of DC's alumni. Second, I would like this body to consider removing recommendation one, which suggests eliminating the single summative rating of schools, which is one of the key sources of information that parents use when choosing schools. In a recent survey of parents conducted by the DC Policy Center, 37% reported, reported using the STAR or school quality ratings and 28% used school report card data, compared to half who mentioned word of mouth or school visits as influential sources of information when selecting their child's school. School visits are so powerful, but there's no way for parents to visit every district in school in the District of Columbia, especially during COVID. And word of mouth is incredibly important as well, but it can be really biased based on who is in your network. It is also important to consider keeping the summative rating of schools in order to be transparent about the data for all schools, not just the lowest performing 5% as recommended um, in recommendation seven. Providing this overall rating allows SBOE to recommend how OSSE should communicate the data to parents and other stakeholders. Before the STAR framework, parents use other sources such as great schools to get a high level comparison of schools. Removing the summative rating will not eliminate the demand for this. It will leave others to aggregate the data in ways that are potentially misleading. If this single rating, um, if SBOE and OSSE remove this single rating that is under their control, they lose the opportunity to communicate how stakeholders should use these summative ratings. Stakeholders may instead make judgments based on a single data point that they value, maybe demographics or proficiency that many associate mistakenly as the most important indicators of school quality, without considering the other more holistic metrics that the STAR framework incorporates, such as academic growth, as we've discussed. Instead of eliminating the single rating, the SPOE could recommend other ways to reduce bias in the STAR rating and its use. This could mean adjusting the weight of the indicators to reduce the influence proficiency. It could also mean including the overall rating for students who are designated at, at, as at risk, for example. And in addition, there could be efforts to educate stakeholders on the front page about how to use the rating or spotlight the challenges and successes experienced by each school. To close, the need for transparent data is even more critical during the pandemic. Removing the summative rating makes it more challenging to track a, overall, a school's overall trajectory in multiple areas and to identify where trends exist across different areas within a school that require improvement and in integrated supports. Thank you very much. Ms. Giles. Um, good evening, my name is Jess Giles. I'm a Ward 7 resident and equity advocate and the State Director of Education Reform Now DC, Earn DC. Earn DC is a nonprofit organization that fights for a just and equitable public education system for all students. 
I'm glad to testify about the Committee on Accountability and Assessments, um, 12 recommendations about the STAR framework. <clears throat> I'm a little bit under the weather, so I I'm, I'm apologize if you have difficulty hearing me today. I urge you to keep the single summative rating and make it more equitable. Parents and guardians want to know that their child's school is safe and provides them with high quality learning opportunities. They use a myriad of tools to help them decide where to send their students to school. These tools, these tools include star or school quality ratings, school report card data, and school visits. Parents and guardians also use the sites like Great Schools Determine School Performance. Parents and guardians should be able to count on DC government to provide one website where they can find easy to understand information that they care about on every school in the district and a single transparent metric for determining annual school performance. The single summative rating must be tied to support that will improve the education opportunities for all students. The DC State Board of Education must provide strong oversight of the set aside of 7% of Title I funds as required by ESSA, which is supposed to be provided to schools in need. Some argue this would, the single summative rating um, increases racial and class segregation. There isn't conclusive evidence of that. In fact, in school years 2016, 17, and 2018, 2019, there were no large changes in racial and ethnic or social economic diversity at the school level, school level given student demographics, nor were there in school years 24, 15, or 26, 17. We can make the STAR rating more equitable by, by assigning greater weights to schools serving students with special needs, English language learners, and students designated as at risk. We should be incentivizing schools to open their doors to these students and identifying resources and inputs that will facilitate learning and growth. I also recommend that the state board hold focus groups with English learner families, families with students with special needs, and families with students designated as at risk to determine the best way to use the DC school report card and star, star framework to better serve their students. There are many aspects of the recommendations I support, but I hope you will strengthen them by keeping the summative rating and making equitable changes to it. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate the panel. Um, that is our last witness for this panel. So if anyone has any questions, please do use the raise your hand feature and I will call on you in order. Mr. O'Sullivan. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, thanks, thanks to all of you for, uh, for coming here and speaking. And it's good to see some of the recurring faces from the past, however many months I've been on the board, including uh, Ms. Kreiner Brown. It's good to see you too. Um, I think, as, as I said earlier, I think this discussion is really interesting. And I think the more that I'm hearing sort of people on both sides of the summative rating, I think it's becoming clear that for the most part, we all want the same thing. Um, and I think that like something that sort of I was reminded of just now is like, how can we integrate our schools better? Because, you know, public schools today, uh, I ran our couple years ago, that said public schools today are more segregated than they were 50 years ago. And I guess the question is, do you, do you want to know how to integrate schools? You integrate them. You, you, you do that. You stop stigmatizing schools based on a summative rating, I think, because I think when people see a rating before they are looking at the information, the other factors that will ultimately inform their decision about where they want to send their child to school, it taints that information. I think it taints the comprehension of that information. Um, I don't think people are calling on a dashboard to get rid of all of the information that people want to actually make an informed decision. But what I do think is that when we provide a summative rating, and I think this point has sort of been belabored by now, but I think when we provide that summative rating, we are taking some of the choice away from the parent and taking some of the choice away from the family, because let's be real. And um, as, as, as Mr. Goldstein said earlier, when a student receives a score on a test and they see the A, they're less likely to go and check, okay, what, what did I do wrong? But if they're told like, hey, look through the problems you got wrong here, you know, I'm not gonna tell you necessarily if it's an A or B for a young child, they may say, oh, so what can I do to improve this? We should think about what we can, what we should do um, for parents so they can decide, hey, I wanna send my school, my child to a school that does this well. And then I think you'll start to see results of having integrated your schools better. And I think that's been an issue for a long time. So I think um, this, the recommendation of removing the summative rating would be good. Thank you. Thank you, Representative O'Sullivan. Uh, Representative Sutter. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Um, thank you all for testifying tonight. Dr. Wolf, um, Ms. Kreiner-Brown, this is primarily a question for both of you. You both mentioned a number of things that are not in our 12 recommendations that you thought would be powerful changes to the report card. 
if we were to add, say, three more recommendations to round it out at 15, what should we add to our recommendations for changes to the report card? Well, I'm happy to start. And I'll say um, I had limited time to review it. So what I did see, uh, I know uh, Dr. Wa or, uh, Representative Wattenberg has asked to show the, the uh, dashboard, like the sort of the idea behind that or the visualization. Uh, and I've talked with a few other people. I'm not prepared to speak on all of the recommendations because I'll be frank between work and kids and all this. Understandable. This, uh, I'd hate to say it, but y'all are happy for my press. You know, you should be pleased that I'm here. No, I'm just kidding. But no, just seriously, like we, we do need more time to, I think, to digest and discuss some of these points. But I, when I knew we were talking about the stars versus moving to a dashboard, that at me immediately got me here. That is a conversation that we have been having since we introduced the stars. And that I think um, any opportunity that we can have to, to step back and reassess those that we should. So thank you. Go ahead, Betsy. Dr. Wolf, you talked about formula stuff and metrics and percentages. So I'd love to hear some more on, on that as well. So, I mean, I what I would say is that um, I think that's in your recommendations that you actually measure school climate and environment beyond just suspensions, which is not useful. So actually getting, you know, a good sense of like whether the school is actually, you know, doing a good job in that regard. I think that's really critical. The other thing that wasn't in there is like, I do think you need to make a distinction between school quality and cumulative measures of students' educational experience. Like, I don't think proficiency should go into school quality, period, the end. You still might want to show it. You still might want to invest resources based on that, but you could separate those two things. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolf. Uh, Dr. O'Leary. Uh, this was fascinating. And especially, Mr. Mullings, I just want to thank you for your eloquent uh, presentation. Uh, I think it encapsulated uh, everything that I think that the star rating isn't. And I'd like to uh, give up the rest of my time to Mr. Bose. Thank you for that. I appreciate that so much. I just wanted to speak to uh, the young lady who was in support of the summative rating uh, system staying in place, but being enhanced um, to make it more resourceful and have it add more value and more uh, equitable input. And so to that, I would say that's the purpose of the dashboard, adding the dashboard uh, to a rating system of the schools would allow uh, schools to have and offer portfolios of what the school does offer, uh, focus on highlighting project-based learning, teacher retention, et cetera. If there has to be a summative rating that's part of the STAR system, enhancing it would be to add the dashboard because the dashboard is gonna speak more to the quality of the uh, in, entire education process, learning process at the school. So you add to it to make it better rather than stay with the summative, which really is uh, really reflects biases. Thank you. Representative O'Leary, do you want to reclaim your time? I do. You have 30 seconds. No, I'm, I'm rescinding it. Oh, thank you. Uh, Representative Wattenberg. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I want to say to um, Mr. Bose, I love this pathways to good trouble. I love it. That is exactly what all of us have been hoping for from the beginning, which is what can we put on this dashboard? How can we show what's going on in the school in ways that simultaneously, because this is the goal, give parents the information they need to make their choices, but also the information that school communities need, that council needs, that all of us need to know um, what the strengths are and where the needs are. So super appreciate that. And the, the comment made by somebody, to me, that's a huge problem with the star rating, um, which is it's not transparent. And even if we switch up the weights and this and that, it's not transparent. It's a number. You don't know what needs to be done. That said, I want to throw this out to anybody who can jump in. What are the... Um, what else should be on this dashboard, um, especially around uh, programs and, and resources that we want to know about, but also other things um, that have not come up yet tonight? Um, and if nobody talks, I'll just start calling on people. Um, I'm apologies. It's late and we're a week away from winter break, so my brain's not at full capacity. But 
I think that one big thing that should be on there is teacher retention. I think whatever our schools are being evaluated on is where the money and the focus is going to go. So right now it's testing and that's where all the money is going and our schools are failing. So clearly it's not working. So holding on to a summative rating is inherently biased and is inherently problematic. So we need to just leave it and try something new because what we're doing isn't working. So I think if we put money into teacher retention, maybe we'll still have teachers. Just found out today our ESL teacher is quitting, is not coming back after winter break. This is about to continue to happen. And like, if we don't change, some, change something, then who cares how we're evaluating schools? There won't be schools to evaluate anymore. Mr. Mullings, do you want to jump in before my time is up? I do apologize. The time is up. Mr. Mullings, if you could add in the chat, yeah, that would be great. I'm Representative Thompson. Oh, I thought Representative Lasoy was ahead of me. Uh, I'm pretty sure she was. But uh, so I'm still curious. Like, I am clear. Uh, we've heard the, the test scores are biased. We've heard they're outsized. Uh, I do want to know, like, is it enough to just remove the stars or do we need to adjust the system and the weights? Uh, I, I, let me know. Short version, both. For many reasons that have been said tonight already. I, uh, Representative Thompson, I've heard you ask this question three times and I've heard three different answers but I keep hearing the question. And so I'm wondering if you're not getting the answer that you're looking for, or is there a way that maybe which you can- Oh, I just it? don't assume everyone agrees. I see, okay, so just getting I, more- I, I literally do not assume everyone agrees. I think a lot of people came here today focused on removing the stars. Yeah. Uh, because that's the easy way to say, we're gonna change the thing. I think a lot of people have not actually looked at our recommendations. And I think a lot of people take for granted if we, move the stars, then it's going to change what the formula is. And so I really want to know if we just take the stars off the report card, is that enough? Is that, does that up in the thing? Or are there other things that we should be doing? Like, should we be changing our measures? Uh, like what, like what is good enough? Because we should be able to push for what is good enough. Right? Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with you. And thank you for that perspective. I think, um, that sometimes there's this idea that one size fits all in education. And uh, I don't believe that's true. We don't work with like grants or budgets or contracts. We work with people um, and people are different and schools are different school to school. I think that there really needs to be a focus on getting to know each individual school and what each individual school needs. I do think to your question that we need, it's, it's both for me. Um, as I put in the chat, I think that labels have connotations and I'm not quite sure what we're trying to what is the goal in labeling a school if we need to offer support? Um, I wouldn't label a student a low performing student. I just want to get them where they need to be. Um, and so I don't know the value of, of the labels. I also- Mr. Mullins, I, I do apologize. I do have to, to move on, but please do continue the, the answer in the, in the chat. Uh, Dr. Reed. Thank you. So yeah, I pulled actually apart my ward data and school safety was something that ward eight uh, valued um, behind progress. So school safety and extra teacher, teacher qualifications were tied. Um, can folks who are on this panel um, talk about if we were to tease out school safety, like what would that look like or any ideas? That could be a part of your um, school climate survey. There's a whole, you could have a whole school safety con construct and you could even talk about what you mean by safety and have people you know, in the community agree and then go from there. I would say to that specific question, if I think about like, how would I talk to my kids about it? So I have a second grader and a pre-K three. I might probably ask them if you feel like you had a problem at school, you feel like there are kids that you could talk to or do you feel like there are adults that you could talk to to help you solve that problem? And I know some, uh, another parent testified earlier on bullying that to me factors into school safety that also gets into data type questions. Um, but that's particularly what comes to me, especially thinking about the elementary level. I also think that may look different once you start reaching across grade bands. I think um, climate survey data will get to the, the question of safety and then also like the type of mental health supports that schools are offering students. 
I think safety is only really possible to focus on if there's less focus on test scores, because as of right now, we don't have time to focus on students' social emotional well being and to focus on how do you treat one another so that you're not bullying? How do you deal with like whatever issues are happening at home that make kids feel like they need to be aggressive or that's the only strategy that they have, right? All of these things are tied and connected and there needs to be space and time in the classroom and at the school to allow for that. And if the focus is on standardized testing and trying to make it be a one size fits all, there isn't time to address the needs of individual students and of individual communities. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Gasoy. Thank you and thank you all for your testimony. Um, I wanna actually speak with my parent hat on. Um, and explain why I would want to remove the stars and a rating of schools in general. And it's because the star rating is a pre-packaged deal, right? Like it's like going to the store and they hand you your bag of groceries and that's what you get. Do I want what's in there? Maybe, maybe not. And so what I'm more interested in as a parent is being able to find the things that I'm looking for in a school. So if I want a school that really focuses on well-rounded education that has arts, that has you know uh, a really strong social emotional learning uh, aspect to it that has high teacher retention, I can look at those indicators and maybe those are rated. And I think that's one of the things we're talking about should we rate the indicators? And I can see is my, is the strong, the school I'm looking at strong in the areas that I care about. I think Mr. Norton touched on this and it really resonated with me as a parent that, you know, what one parent may value in a school and be looking for in a school may not be what I'm looking for and may not be what, you know, my neighbor is looking for. So for me, that's part of it is that I don't want a pre-packaged rating that tells me what I'm supposed to think about this school based on these five indicators. So that's part of it. But I guess I would also say, you know, we have found, we have agreed that this particular star rating is biased. <laughs> and so removing that is a way of removing the bias. I do think that's a really important point to re-emphasize. So um, I will yield the rest of my four seconds. Thank you. Uh, Representative Chang. Thank you, Maya, your, your point um, just got me thinking. So I'm, th I'm thinking out loud with you all right now, your, your point about how if we put different things on the dashboard, that schools would start to prioritize those pieces um, and fund them. And I, I, I'm thinking back to what what President Parker asked in our last to our last panelist, which was, you know, making sure that actually what we through this new system point out actually does get fixed. And that 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 piece of the work, how I, I'd love your feedback on how do we make sure that what we observe and discover and display is missing is actually then acted upon that the services are actually then provided to make sure that they go through should is it okay to assume that if we change the the way that the information is displayed that it will trickle down and 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 it will be fixed the way that I, i'm hearing you say maya or what do we need to do to make sure that that actually happens that's a great question and i think the current way we do it is that we put it on teachers and schools to make sure that that gets fixed and then we have a lot of like leaders that don't do anything <laughs> Um, and so I apologize if there are tears, I'm very tired, um, but like they should be in charge. Like they're the leaders, they're getting paid a lot of money and they get to do it. So like hold them accountable. Like we are tired and we don't have the, the space. Like, I don't know what to do right now. Like we have been begging for support and for trainings and for useful data and we get nothing. We get blamed, we get shamed, we get silenced, we get gaslit. Like what else is there to say? Like, I don't know what else to do. Um, I don't have the answers, but I'm also, I'm not a leader. I have my classroom. 
we have a proposal from empower ed that shows all of the things and the way it can work and i would say to look at that because i think um that was thought in a time where brains were working better than right now in this moment but i think that like this hey, is a Ms. really good question Tom, and I, please go to the leaders thank like, you very much um representative Cheng, your time has expired Thank you so much, panel, for, for being here today. Um, that was the last of our questions, I believe. And so we are uh, happy to dismiss you for the evening. Thank you so much for your patience. Members, I'm going to be bringing in the, the last panel now. Um, and as, as they come in, I will remind everyone um, on the public panel that's coming in that we do now have uh, three minutes per witness. And I will be calling you in order um, as close as I can to the order that was on the agenda. Um, which means minutes, that we will a witness and I will be calling you in order. Um, and also please do um, uh, close the YouTube if you have been watching it there, um, because it does uh, give us that, that feedback. And we'll begin tonight with uh, Mr. Boots. Uh, I tried to share my screen. I was un unable to. One second. Okay, Mr. Boots, you should be able to do so now. Um, so many things. Oh my God, stop share. Not stop share. Shit. I mean, sorry, my apologies. Um, I can't even get this to. Do you see my screen? Sorry, John Paul, and sorry to the board, and sorry to everyone else who's coming after me. Do you see anything? Uh, we we don't yet. Why don't you? Um, we'll move to somebody else and then come back to you once we've we've been able to fix the technical error. Yeah, um, my apologies to the entire board and everyone who comes after me. Thank you, um, Ms. Cole. All right. Good evening, members of the State Board of Education. My name is Ms. Cole. I'm sorry, Mr. Yep. Booth's screen is still showing. Okay. Give me one second. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Sarah Cole and I come to you as an educator who now serves as an equity coordinator at a public charter school in Northwest DC after serving that same school as a middle school humanities teachers for years. I am here tonight to answer your call for community feedback on the DC STAR framework and I am and your recommendations for changes with it. And I am doing so through an intentional lens of equity for our students, families, and educators. In so many ways, the current framework operates in opposition to our district-wide commitment to equity. As a result, I'm offering my reflections on the changes to or reimaginations of this framework that we should pursue as we go on the crucial endeavor of eradicating the ways in which racism, classism, sexism, ableism, queer phobia, and all the other isms and phobias negatively predict the outcomes and experiences of our most vulnerable community members. In this moment, you all are asking, how can we measure, report, and respond to school quality in a way that pushes our schools closer towards equity rather than further from it? In responding to this question, I'm inspired by the words of education and social justice leader Shane Safir in her book, Street Data. It's time to repurpose data from a tool of accountability and oppression to a tool for learning and transformation. I believe DC is more than ready to answer this call, rejecting the empty promises of accountability, instead turning to the hope of data as a tool for school transformation. I have deep faith in our community's capacity to do this, but we cannot do so if standardized test scores are the data we hold most dear. We know and have known for years now that standardized test scores are biased and can be almost completely predicted by a student's race and class. And despite DC education leaders professing that our standardized tests are somehow not biased or racist, and Aussie's own analysis of student testing data, the same predictability and biases did appear. Given this information, I'd like to recommend make the following recommendations. One, that we remove the singular summative rating for schools, which we know does not actually 
really reflect all that is happening within a school. Instead, I recommend providing a dashboard with ratings for key areas. I specifically would like to recommend the areas that um, were identified by Empower Ed in the survey that we collected um, from more than 500 community members, including uh, folks in Ward 7 and 8, which I know doesn't always happen. Um, and the key areas we are recommending are school climate, academic growth, teachers, well-rounded education, equitable academic growth, student safety, support, and justice. More importantly, I believe it's essential that we are tying supports to schools who have low performances within any of these key areas. If schools are not scoring well within these key areas, they should be given supports related to the key areas that they are not doing well in. I further do not believe that we should be publishing the schools that might be ranking in the bottom 5%, but we should be offering those schools the support that they need. Um, and I will pause there. I have a lot more to say, but I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Um, please do note um, for all public witnesses, we do welcome your written testimony as well. So please do send it to us so we can have the full statement. Uh, Mr. Deskins. Good evening. It's been such a long evening now. We're getting towards the end. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I come here this evening as a Ward 7 resident, parent, and member of the Ward 7 Ed Council Executive Board, whose behalf I speak on today. Uh, as you know, Ward 7, like predominantly Black communities across this city and across the country, um, struggle under institutional racism, marginalization based on race and class, and the associated lack of investment, engagement, and racial equity-minded policies needed to truly facilitate positive outcomes for our community and our growing scholars. Um, knowing that, you know that education policies have do and will continue, uh, if we don't do something about it, uh, perpetuate and exacerbate these same disparities. So with that in mind, um, I'm here, probably you could have guessed to talk about the star rating. Um, and, uh, we see that as one of those policies that perpetuate and exacerbate the same disparities um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, it's reductive, like standardized tests in general, represents privilege and access to resources, not the quality of teaching or the quality of in-school experiences, while lacking the quantitative input that will be useful to parents, uh, teacher satisfaction, student satisfaction, parent satisfaction teacher and principal retention and other info parents may find useful, useful, sorry. It also assumes families understand the rating system and have the appropriate data literacy to put the rating in context with the other useful inputs. Most importantly, the star rating system does not represent who our Ward 7 schools are. Uh, it stigmatizes our schools, hindering teacher recruitment, community trust, uh, continuing the stigma cycle of lower ratings, discourage families from attending, then baseline fan funding is based on enrollment, so school funding shrinks as student population shrinks. With less funding, then there are fewer resources to serve the children, which drives down student performance and drives down the school ratings and repeat. Uh, that was a mouthful. It's late, but we're just going to bear with me because I got 30 seconds. Um, Overall, it is a position of the Ward 7 Ed Council that the star rating is entirely and unnecessary, entirely unnecessary and should be ended as a practice. Um, I have 10 seconds, so I just wanted to also note that uh, there's a larger comment about the overall engagement of the Ward 7 community on issues like this. And I wanted to raise that the time frame to which we found out this proposals and this here uh, public comment period is, it's just not adequate for um, our area of the city, which is dealing with the digital divide and other ways that other things that make communication with our community more difficult. And um, that may show by uh, the lack of engagement from Ward 7 um, parents and community members in the outreach. Thank you very much, Mr. Deskins. We appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Boots, I'm going to come back to you. Um, I'm going to try to share, I'm going to share the screen and hopefully you'll be able to unmute. Okay, give me one second.
Thank you. And again, my apologies to the board and to all those testifying tonight. Uh, thank you, State Board, for allowing me to join the conversation this evening about the star rating. In front of you, um, you see 2014, a 2014 NFL dashboard of statistics related to NFL teams. I would like to encourage you to look at this dashboard for a second and pick out which teams were the higher performing teams that were uh, part of the playoff system and the lower performing teams that were provided additional support by receiving top draft picks in the next year's draft, NFL draft. No, she better reclaim your time. <laughs> Don't wait on us. <laughs> I have plenty of time, JP. Uh, maybe it helps to actually produce some uh, colors, JP, if you can go to the next slide. So maybe the colors will help you figure it out which of the teams were the higher performing teams and which are the lower performing teams. JP, you can go to the next slide. Um, we know that, well, that doesn't really appear as I as it should, is, much like how our parents know about proficiency, we all know about touchdowns, right? We've all seen NFL games, we know about touchdowns. And I think if you look at touchdowns, maybe you can figure out which teams are the higher performing teams, which are the lower performing teams. Thank you, Mr. Sutter. Mark Sutter, Sutter uh, I see in your chat, that would be incorrect. Uh, just because a team has a, <laughs> receives more touchdowns doesn't mean that they are necessarily the higher performing team. Um, JP, you can go on the next slide. So Empire K-12 did an analysis of weightless data and looked at how are parents using information to determine school quality. And we know that from the data on weightless length, that's our parents are using school dem student demographics, student achievement, the school location, re-enrollment rate, which is really a proxy for us as the sort of word of mouth, way before the star rating. And the star rating has 50% attributed to growth. So our parents currently are using school demographics and student achievement as a proxy for student, uh, for school quality. And what we believe, and what I hope that all of you believe is that like, that is not what we would consider measures of school quality. We believe in Power K-12 and the reason why we do bold schools, the way, the reason why we attribute and um, default all of our dashboards to students designated as at risk is because school quality is only, a school is only as good as its students who are historically furthest from opportunity perform. And so for us, the state board has spent more time on talking about things and metrics when we should be talking about how are our students furthest from opportunity performing? And we would love to see you engage in a conversation about how our students designated as at risk, students with disabilities and our English language learners are doing. Mr. Bruce, thank you so because much for your us, testimony. To us, that is the measure of school quality. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. Ms. Mascoso. Sorry about that, I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> uh, just, I'm reading my uh, testimony online. Okay, great. Um, good evening, representatives. I'm Sandra Moscoso, a DCPS parent since 2006. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening on the recommendations that the, S the, the SBO SBOE has made about Aussie's school transparency and star reporting framework. When the STAR framework was initially under development, I joined fellow families in calling for a more balanced report card that took into account measures reflective of a school's culture, enrichment opportunities, and meeting needs of students. Throughout the ESSA STAR framework engagement process, 
Parents and teachers urged ASI and SBOE to reduce the weight of test scores to the lowest percent legally allowed, um, which was at the time around 55% for elementary and less for high schools. Unfortunately, our concerns and input were ignored, and this is back in 2016, 2017. Today, the SBOE and ASI have the opportunity to correct a system that has not only failed to help our schools strengthen programming and supports, but instead has hurt schools caught in a cycle of underinvestment, low ratings, and underenrollment. I support efforts that strengthen school transparency and accountability that help caregivers make decisions about their students' education. The STAR framework, and particularly the summative rating that comes without context of economic disadvantage, underfunding, uh, you know, staffing and resource cuts are sustained across years. Um, facility issues and other relevant factors does not achieve transparency. According to SBOE's own parent survey, parents do not use the STAR rating when selecting a school, nor see it as important when, make, when making school decisions. It just doesn't make sense to continue with a framework hurtful to schools and not useful to parents. Um, and I just, uh, I wanna, it's not in my written testimony, but I do wanna highlight um, what Representative Thompson asked earlier about the balance of how um, the report card um, is evaluating schools. And I think that's a, a good point to make. It's not in my testimony, but yes, right now it is off balance because it weights so heavily on testing. Um, so thank you for that, um, Representative Thompson. I support efforts to provide principals with decision useful information and data-driven assistance. However, according to SBOE's principal survey uh, on STAR, so survey of principals, most principals reported not receiving supports based on their school's 2019 STAR rating. And most principals said that non-academic STAR framework indicators that focused on whole child education and student slash family satisfaction would provide a more accurate picture of their school's quality. It just doesn't make sense to continue with a framework that not only does not help principals receive support, but also does not provide an accurate picture of how schools meet student needs. Finally, thank you to the um, State Board Committee on Accountability and Assessment for providing recommendations on next steps for the STAR framework. I fully support eliminating the single summative rating of schools and thank representatives Wattenberg and Reed for voting to do this. I agree with the recommendation to provide a dashboard with more detailed information about school quality. I agree with the proposed formula used to identify the bottom 5%. I apologize for interrupting. Your, your time has expired. If you can make sure to, to continue the remarks in the written testimony, that would yeah. be helpful. It's, it's over, so thank, thank you. you so much. Ms. Sanabria? Sanabria. Sanabria, thank you. <laughs> okay, greetings representatives. I'm here today to endorse the switch to a dashboard model. The star rating framework is a punitive accountability measure we use out of a desire for efficiency and convenience. By continuing with our summative method, which as we've heard repeatedly tonight is mostly based on test scores that have been proven to be racially and socioeconomically biased, we will continue to reduce students and teachers to a number. And we will continue to message to community members that what they value in a school doesn't matter. A comprehensive dashboard model is not only a more equitable option, it's more representative of what a school really offers its students, families, faculty, and staff. A dashboard model will lead to more informed decision-making for families when they are choosing a school and educators when they are choosing a place of work. In lieu of continuing with my own feelings on the star rating, I'd like to share some comments Empower Ed has received from the public since we started surveying about star in 2019. They illustrate what rating and labeling schools does to school communities. It's a reductive way to summarize a very complex organization. It leads to categorizations of good and bad schools. We're not hotels or restaurants, but human beings working hard and doing our best daily to support students and their families. To reduce everything that we do to stars feels cheap and overly simplistic. It leads to an inclination to manipulate the system. It ends up being a disservice to kids because the school is so focused on the rating that they sacrifice other elements. The star rating system is a tiny snapshot of a school. It doesn't accurately capture all of the elements that make up a school's environment. In addition, it doesn't capture things that are important to parents when choosing a school for their children. 
The ranking of schools on a punitive system is subjective and does not tell the full story of what the school has to offer. The rating is subjective and has a high focus on testing, never addressing the chronic stress and trauma kids bring with them to school. Schools are meant to spark joy for learning. As a parent, this rating does not capture the feel of the school, the joy inside its walls. And I'm sure there are schools with low ratings that have a wonderful environment to learn in. I think it's ridiculous to rate schools based on standardized tests. These tests are discriminatory and do not accurately reflect what students are able to do, nor does it accurately reflect the learning environment of a school. The star rating system incorrectly labels communities as failures. This star system labels teachers, administrators, parents, students, and everyone in our, in our community one star. This is demoralizing. Each school has different needs and different ways to learn from feedback in order to improve. Board members, as you continue in your reform efforts, listen to what the district's residents are asking you for. In our quest to improve education in our city, we have been gagged and shortchanged too many times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Wells. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening on the recommendations the State Board of Education has made on the OSSI STAR framework. I commend the State Board of Education's Research Committee for the thoughtful work they did this past year and a half to develop recommendations to improve the STAR framework. The research committee's work provides an opportunity to make meaningful changes in how schools are held accountable. How schools are measured has profound impacts on what students are taught in the classroom, on school enrollment, and on how schools serving our most vulnerable students are viewed. I testified before the State Board of Education in March of 2017 about concerns with the direction Aussie was planning to take with the STAR framework. Highest among my concerns was that 70% of the STAR rating system weight was based on standardized test scores. Since the STAR rating has been in effect, we have seen the rating is more co closely correlated with the socioeconomic status of the students who are enrolled in the school than with the quality of education the students receive. The State Board of Education's Research Committee acknowledged this correlation in their December 2020 interim report on the STAR rating. In our consumer society, we love to buy products that get five stars and definitely don't purchase products that get one or two stars. Before the STAR framework was put in place, I attended a focus group that was designed to gather parents' ideas for the STAR framework. I recall a father who spoke up wondering why anyone would send their child to a one-star school. Since the star rating system has been put in place, some, but not all families, have made the decision not to enroll their children in one or two star schools, leading to community perceptions that one or two star schools do not provide a quality education. My own daughter attended a one-star middle school. While I would be the first to admit the school had many areas that needed to be improved, it also had many strengths. I agree with representatives Wattenberg and Reed who voted earlier this month to eliminate the single summative rating of schools. I also agree with the recommendation to provide a dashboard of information with more detailed information about school quality. However, I believe the elements of the dashboard the State Board of Education has recommended need to be further fleshed out. Two elements I believe should be considered for the dashboard are teacher experience, retention, and school safety. In closing, I want to express a concern and a hope. My concerns with the school choice system our city has embraced, along with a star rating that supports school choice. The school choice system and star rating has led to further segregation of our public schools, and it has continued to leave behind those children most at risk. My hope is that our city will work to strengthen our by right public schools so that regardless of where you live, all students will receive a quality education and that we provide a supportive environment for all students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and members of the board, I'm excited to find out who our last witness is. Um, they are joining us by iPhone. And so um, if the one public witness who has not testified yet wants to unmute and uh, start testimony, that would be great. Is our guest on, on the iPhone available to testify? If not, I'm, we can move to questions. 
Okay, seeing none, we can move to questions. Um, and members, as, as always, please do use the raise your hand feature and we will proceed through the list. Um, Representative Shang. Thank you, this one's for uh, Mr. Boots. Uh, you mentioned the question, how are students furthest from opportunity performing? And if that were the ultimate goal, I'm curious how you would measure that and how you would also communicate that with families. Um, for that, we would, the furthest from opportunity, those are students designated as at risk, students with disabilities and our English language learners. If we were to use the subscore, which is already available for students designated as at risk, how many five-star schools would we have in wards three and six? Zero, right? Um, that's because we know that to me and to Empower K-12, our schools are only as strong as our students who are furthest from opportunity. And so for us, we should be focusing on how are our schools doing for students designated as high risk and our students with disabilities and our English language learners. So is that, are you, would that be a proposal to tweak the weights? Yes, right? Like the current star score is more than 50% growth, right? Like there's academic growth, there's at there's attendance growth. Attendance growth is also very important because attendance growth only happens when we provide strong school um, environment, right? Like when our schools have the opportunities for our students that they want and need, like, I think if we were to look around the room, none of us came to school in middle school because our math teacher and our reading teacher were like, that's why. Right, we came for our friends, we came for other opportunities. We need to be providing those other opportunities and providing strong math and reading curriculum at the same time. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you, Representative O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, John Paul. Thanks to each of you guys um, who came here and testified today um, and shed light on this discussion. Um, I'll just say one thing. Um, I am a big football fan. I can appreciate football references, but I didn't really appreciate that football spreadsheet for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't think it's fair to um, compare a game like football to an education system. Um, and a big part of that is that in football, there's a win or loss. Every single game, there's a winner or there's a loser. Um, and at the end of the day, you can look back at the season and say, okay, the Buccaneers were 10 and seven or something like that. And the truth is in our education system, it's much more complicated than that. And I don't like the comparison that I feel like was being insinuated of how a star rating and a record um, and a record in football are kind of the same. I don't appreciate that because I think, you know, football is very different than education for the fact that when it comes down to it, both teams could have played terribly. A team could be bad at football. They could still somehow put together a bunch of wins. I don't think we should be Again, and I'm sorry to harp on this point, but I think it's somewhat misleading also in the spreadsheet to not include the, the, the record of those teams too, because um, when we're talking about the dashboard, we're talking about providing people information they need and to make a decision, an informed decision. And with the, with, with the spreadsheet that was used, I'm, I'm afraid that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to say something objective like a record can be something that is not as objective, that has weights, that has different things that you value, like a star rating. And as we've talked about, the star rating can be biased and NFL record can't be. Um, I, I just want to point that out because that didn't sit right with me. Um, and I, and I kind of felt like it was a little bit disrespectful um, to teachers and to the people who have testified here today. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll just say one last time, I'm in support of removing the summative rating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Sullivan. Dr. Sutter. Um, thank you very much, John Paul. So I actually wanna direct my questions to Ms. Wells. Uh, Ms. Wells, thank you so much for testifying tonight. As a Ward 6 resident, you and I have talked about a number of things you raised um, in lots of settings, but I wanted to ask two questions. Um, tonight, a lot of folks have talked about not liking the summative rating, not just for reasons of bias, but also because they don't think that the state should dictate what matters to families in choosing a school. So I'm hearing a lot of people say, I want to choose a school based on what I care about. But I know you and I have had many discussions on the fact that you're pretty uncomfortable with aspects of school choice. And you really want us to strengthen the neighborhood by right system of schools. Um, which would seem to sort of veer away from empowering people to make choices about schools 
based on factors they preferred. So I'd love to give you a minute to talk about that. I'd also like to know what you'd like to see as a rating of a measure of school safety, because you mentioned that. Thank you. You're on mute. I'm sorry, I I didn't quite hear all of the question. There was some internet disconnect. Um, can you repeat the very last part of your question, Jessica? You're on mute, mute now. This was about the use of information for choosing schools. The second was what you'd like to see as a measure of school safety. So, well, let me just say, I think that when I think about school choice, I actually think about things like the school offerings, like if they offer a language immersion program, if they're a Montessori program. Um, those things I think are very important to families because families are looking for different types of educational opportunities. Um, and I think within our um, public by right school system, we have those types of choices that families can make. Um, so that's, that's what's important for me. Um, and, and I think that everybody who lives in our city, regardless of where you live, should have opportunities to choose within, you know, something that's relatively close to you, um, should be able to choose those types of educational opportunities for their children. I Thank don't you know very much, Ms. Well, I apologize. I do, I do need to cut in. Um, if you want to finish the rest of your response in the chat, we would appreciate it. Representative Thompson. I will first say I also happen to like football a lot. Uh, I understand uh, Representative Sullivan's uh, aversion to the testimony. I will say I took away something different. I think uh, the headline for me uh, was it is actually uh, can be overwhelming and less transparent when you just have a lot of data. Uh, and just because it's a dashboard doesn't necessarily make it transparent or tell you the whole story. Uh, we can critique the way the presentation happened later, but I think that was the uh, point. Uh, I, again, uh, want to know from people, is it just enough, and, and given that, is it just enough to remove uh, the stars or does it actually matter uh, how we weigh things, what we measure? If I could jump in, I would say that it's not enough to just remove the summative um, rating that we definitely need we have to be very intentional about what it is that we're measuring. As folks have named before, like what we decide to measure is what gets valued and what gets attention to it. And I also think that there really has to be that essential step of tying supports to schools, not just the schools in the bottom 5%, but to all schools that are scoring low within the different indicators to receive supports related to those indicators. Yeah. I don't know if this question was for all of us, but um, uh, I would add that um, I would I would disagree uh, as a parent, and I think the rest of the exec board for the Ward Seven Ed Council would also disagree with anyone who says that the star just getting rid of the star rating itself would you know solve these underlying problems that we have. Um, I think that the other part that I touched on a bit when I was um, speaking before is that we also need to make sure that we, we have the information that is useful to parents and we're able to use that to help parents make um, informed decisions. And that information, you know, there's no way that you can do that perfectly anytime you're deciding on certain things that are gonna be the way that you that you decide a value, there's always going to be imperfections there. But I think that um, making sure that it was it's done in a way that 
um, furthers equity, but also uh, doesn't automatically paint um, schools in Ward 7, in Ward 5, and Ward 8 in a worse light um, for Thanks. no other reason besides privilege and access to resources. Um, I Thank you very much, Mr. Dust, because I do apologize. Um, I do need to, to break in. Um, Representative Wattenberg. Okay, I'm going to try to be super fast here. First, I've had up my notes all night. One thing I want to say is thank you to Empower Ed and the people who came from our Empower Ed, especially for doing these surveys that went all over the city. You got incredible outreach, and I want to steal a lot of your ideas on behalf of the board so that when we do future surveys, we can just have this huge, huge outreach. So that's number one. Number two, I just want to say quickly on uh, Mr. Boots's um, uh, di um, uh, testimony that schools are only as good as the students who are the furthest behind naming students with disabilities at risk and ELL. And I don't know if you got to look at our proposal uh, that we put forward in terms of that dashboard, it would make exactly those students and the growth they made um, a, excuse, central would be one of four things that was on the dashboard. All right, so I wanna talk to you uh, offline about exactly how you would do that that's different than that, because it does seem to me that we tried to center, to center that, and if there are other ways we can do that, uh, we do wanna do that. And then with my last minute, I really wanna to go to the parents, which I think at this point with Ms. Moscoso gone is um, uh, Mr. Deskins and Ms. Wells, if there's someone else say so, and that is this, it really goes to um, Ms. Thompson's point about how, can, how difficult it was to read the football scores. Part of what we have been trying to do is find a way that is easy and simple for parents. We are a choice city. Parents do use this information for choice. How to make it simple enough and easy enough to understand, but also include the in information parents want and do it transparently, not in an opaque composite. And my question, if you have looked at this, what do you think? How close are we? How much, uh, what else can we do to make it simultaneously easy to use, not overwhelming? and provide the right information. So you each get six seconds and you can go offline. I will yield my time because I got the information kind of late and really did not have time to really get into it. All right, uh -huh. I would love to talk, talk to you offline. Okay, as well. Great, thank you so I, much. Uh, I, I do apologize, Representative Waterberg, your time has expired. Ms. Wells, if you could respond in the chat, that would be, that would be very helpful. Um, Representatives, I don't see additional questions for this panel, so I am going to um, release them with our deepest thanks for all of their patience in, in uh, waiting for us to get to them during the, the meeting. Um, and public witnesses, you are released and can uh, um, log off of the meeting. Um, we are happy to take additional comments through email or through written testimony, or you can stay and put them in the chat really quickly now. Um, thank you very much. Um, I believe I'm turning it back over to you, President Parker, for the next section. Yes, um, thank you to uh, those that testified. Uh, our work will move forward uh, to January where we are planning to uh, make a final recommendation on changes to the STAR framework. So please stay tuned um, and we will be in touch uh, based on your recommendations tonight. Uh, members, we are now gonna move on to the voting portion of uh, Mr. Boots, is that a question? Is that? I was just wondering if I had the opportunity to respond to Representative Sullivan. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. The, maybe point of order that that's out of order. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, not at this point. But uh, I would encourage you to touch base offline. Will do, Representative Sullivan. I just want to say I appreciate your comments, and um, I will you, connect Booth. with you offline. Thank you. Uh, members, we um, are moving forward uh, to the ceremonial resolution portion of our meeting, uh, the first of which, and I just want to note, uh, I will be put out of this venue very shortly, and so Vice President Gasoy will take over, but first, our first uh, ceremonial resolution is in celebration of our 2022 Teacher of the Year, Dominique Foster. Uh, Foster has joined us tonight, I believe. I believe she is logging in shortly. Awesome. Um, so why don't we wait until she's here? Um, 
Mr. Hayward, do you know, do you have a sense of how long that might be or should we go to another resolution and come back? I, I do not. If you uh, want to move on, that would be fine or we, I can start reading and read very slowly. Uh, I would rather her be here for it. Uh, so I'm going to say, let's go to the next one and then come back so she can hear the resolution. Um, thank you all for being oh, flexible. Oh, so I, believe, I believe she is currently joining. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome, Ms. Foster. Hello. <laughs> we're, we're thrilled to have you here. If you could mute your YouTube uh, in the back, Ms. Foster, uh, we're Hello. getting feedback. Awesome. Just a second. Uh, we are thrilled to have you, um, and you uh, are uh, our first ceremonial resolution of the evening. Um, so now that uh, Ms. Foster has joined us, uh, Representative Thompson, would you like to make the motion on the resolution? I moved. Uh, Representative Thompson from Ward 7 has... Uh, moved uh, to recognize uh, Ms. Dominique Foster as our 2022 Teacher of the Year. Uh, is there a second for the resolution that we have in front of us? Second. second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Mr. Hayworth, can you please read the resolution into the record? State Board of Education ceremonial resolution recognizing Dominique Foster as 2022 DC Teacher of the Year, CR 21-26. Whereas the Office of the State Superintendent of Education awarded the 2022 DC Teacher of the Year Award to Dominique Foster, a passionate and adaptable pre-K-4 teacher at Friendship Public Charter School Blow Pierce Campus in Ward 7. Whereas Ms. Foster holds a bachelor's degree in organizational communication from Xavier University and is currently working on a master's degree in Montessori education at Xavier University. Whereas Ms. Foster has 13 years of experience as an educator and has taught at Friendship PCS Blow Pierce uh, for the past six years, whereas Ms. Foster provided her students with high quality instruction and creative educational opportunities during distance learning, like inviting guest speakers such as former DC Mayor and Ward 7 Councilmember Vincent C. Gray to visit her virtual classroom so that students could engage with community members despite the ongoing pandemic. Whereas Ms. Foster played an integral role in supporting her school to fully transition to in-person learning this year and continue to engage families by using video conferencing platforms and lunchtime activities to support preschoolers struggling to learn away from home. Whereas Ms. Foster was awarded $7,500 in addition to the title of DC Teacher of the Year for her hard work and dedication to her students and their families. And whereas Ms. Foster will represent the District of Columbia in the 2022 National Teacher of the Year competition. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the District of Columbia State Board of Education honors the commitment and passion that Ms. Dominique Foster provides every day to the students, staff, and community of Friendship Public Charter School Blow Pierce Elementary and the District of Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Uh, and congratulations again, Ms. Foster. We are thrilled to have you. Uh, members, uh, is there a discussion on this resolution? Please raise your hand. and Vice President Gasoy, if you are there, uh, I'm gonna ask for you to call the roll, but first I will call on Representative Thompson to kick us off here. So I uh, am super proud uh, that we have back-to-back -back, uh, Teachers of the Year in Ward 7. Uh, I did have the pleasure uh, of being there when they surprised Ms. Foster. Uh, I will say uh, that my mother is jealous of Miss Foster's classroom. I took pictures. Uh, Miss Brantley was <laughs> kind enough to uh, give me a private tour of the classroom. Uh, and the first thing she said was, people like this who do things like this for kids are the ones we should be lifting up uh, as teachers of the year. Uh, your space, uh, not just the, the feeling it gives, but you just can look at it. Uh, and see the quality of space you are providing for our little people. Um, and so I thank you for that. I also thank you for uh, just 
coming and sharing and talking. And, and so we actually had a conversation with uh, both of our teachers of the year back to back at the education council meeting. Um, our, those meetings are recorded. Um, I encourage people to listen in because as much as we have talked about uh, all the challenges teachers are facing this year, I do not want it to be lost that despite all of those challenges, we have people doing amazing things. Uh, we have people showing up to support kids every day in a way that should be celebrated, invested in, and proud of. So I just want to say I'm so proud, Ms. Foster, uh, that is you. Uh, I've heard from parents that you are awesome. And I'll be back as soon as I can, you know, get make this mad dash to the end of the year. Um, because I'd, I'd love to experience your classroom a little bit more. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Um, okay, next, uh, Representative O'Leary. I just, uh, I just feel so good. Just looking at Ms. Foster's face, uh, what a, what a wonderful uh, day they must the kids must have every day because you can tell how much she loves doing it and there are so many teachers in the city who can't wait to go to work every day absolutely thank, thank you, you dr o'leary that's my pleasure i am not seeing other hands and i would just say quickly and excuse the mac background music if you hear it i'm a little jealous of ward seven that they have just been posting uh back to back uh teacher of the years um and miss foster your your name is ringing across the city as one of those teachers uh that we all can learn so much from and so i have yet to uh, be able to visit your classroom but i will uh take the opportunity if you would have it uh, so I would love the opportunity to come witness and observe, uh, especially given our conversations tonight and thinking about the students that need the most support, need the most investment, need the most uh, uh, quality instruction. Uh, you are uh, a testament to what is possible. And what I appreciate about the resolution that we're voting on here tonight is that you, uh, much of the conversation earlier was around what's not working. You are an example of what is working. And so we wanna amplify that uh, much more and uh, use it as an inspiration. So congratulations again. Thank you, Mr. Parker. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Uh, hi, Ms. Sutter, we see you as well. I live in Ward 6. Uh, so yes, you should be jealous of Ward 7, but I love my Ward 6 residents as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I love y'all and I appreciate you all. Thank you. Um, we will make sure to get you a copy of the resolution. But with that, uh, Mr. Hayworth, can you please call? Uh, yeah. Can you please call the roll? The motion is on uh, CR 21-26, recognizing Dominique Foster as the 2022 Teacher of the Year. Representative Kasoy. Of course, yes. Representative Chang. Of course, yes, and congratulations. Representative Wattenberg. Absolutely, congratulations. Representative O'Leary. Oh yeah. Representative Sutter. Absolutely, congratulations, Ms. Foster. Representative Thompson. Yes. Representative Reed. Congratulations and yes. Representative Patterson. Yes, and congratulations as well. Representative O'Sullivan. Yes, and congrats. Representative Lopez. Absolutely. President Parker. Yes. The motion is unanimously passed. Congratulations, Ms. Foster. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all you do. Um, okay, is this my cue? Yes, okay. Um, so thank you so much again, Ms. Foster. Uh, you can stay if you want, but it's late. So um, you are welcome to also do what you need to do. We are moving on. Um, to our next ceremonial resolution, which recognizes Special Education Day. Uh, Representative Sutter, would you like to make the motion? Yes, I move. 
Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Great. Uh, the motion being properly moved and seconded, Mr. Hayworth will read the resolution. State Board of Education ceremonial resolution recognizing National Special Education Day, CR 21-27. Whereas National Special Education Day takes place on December 2nd each year, Whereas the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia ruled in 1971 in Mills v. Board of Education that it is unlawful to deny exceptional students, including those with special education needs, access to publicly funded educational opportunities. Whereas President Gerald Ford signed the Education for All Handicapped Children Act on November 29, 1975. Whereas the Education for All Handic Handicapped Children Act was renamed to the Individuals with Education Disabilities Act, IDEA, in 1990. Whereas National Special Education Day was first established on December 2nd, 2005, in honor of the 30th anniversary of IDEA. Whereas this National Special Education Day marks its 16th anniversary and the 46th anniversary of IDEA. Whereas IDEA has been essential in improving services and standards in the American education system. Whereas support for special education is critical to ensure that all our students are provided with the best opportunities for success, both in and out of the classroom. And whereas the DC State Board of Education has heard public testimony that the needs of special education students in the district have too often been neglected during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now therefore be resolved that the DC State Board of Education recognizes December 2nd as National Special Education Day and firmly believes in the power of special education to create an ideal learning environment for all students, regardless of their background, and be it further resolved that the DC State Board of Education recognizes the vital importance of quality special education to ensuring equitable outcomes for all of our students and is committed to guaranteeing that all DC students with special education needs are given their proper resources, instruction, and care that will allow them to achieve their fullest potential. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Uh, is there discussion? Uh, Dr. Reed. I was gonna let Representative Sutter go first and she introduced the bill or she, um, yeah, introduced the, not a bill, Dr. resolution. <laughs> I, I appreciate the deference. I'll take it and swap it right back to you. Um, thank you so much, Vice President Gasoy and Dr. Reed. Um, I was glad to introduce this ceremonial resolution because while December 2nd may be special education day for thousands of children in the District of Columbia, every day is special education day. As a student with a disability, when you go to school, you are counting on your educators and all those who work in your school to support your education in a way that is equitable and quality. Uh, so I think that all of us on the board have heard from parents and from advocates about various issues related to serving children with disabilities during the pandemic to helping students get their required and related services. Um, and we have all asked lots of questions about that, kept on top of it, and I'm pleased that we do that. I hope that we will continue to do that and continue to make sure that as we hopefully uh, exit pandemic conditions and move back to uh, conditions where students are in school more consistently, that we're really focused on making sure that students with disabilities are getting all the services and supports that they and their families need to succeed. We'll kick it back to Dr. Reed. Thank you, Dr. Sutter. Dr. Reed. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sutter, for um, recognizing Special Education Day. And I do have to plug, there's key legislation um, in Congress for fully funding IDEA. Um, on November 16th, uh, Senators Chris Van Hullen and Representative Jared Huffman from California. Um, Van Hullen, of course, is from Maryland. Um, introduced a bill to fully fund IDEA. Um, and I learned this through my professional organization who was really encouraging folks to reach out to your representatives for support of this bill. So DC, reach out to, of course, Representative Norton. Um, if you're from somewhere else, reach out to your representative. But I want to quickly just um, give the one sentence. It says, under the, under the 1975 IDEA legislation, the federal government committed to pay 40% of the average per pupil expenditure for special education. However, that pledge has never been met and current funding is at 15.7%. The IDEA EA full funding act will require regular increases in India IDEA spending to fully meet our commitment to America's children. So uh, however you can, wherever you can, please support um, this important legislation to get um, IDEA fully funded. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, Dr. O'Leary. I just wanna mention one thing about what special education is. 
and uh, as opposed to what a lot of people think special education is, For, because special education has a broad range of um, non abilities, not necessarily disabilities, but abilities that can be altered with uh, love and care. And uh, coming from a, a school that had at least a third of the students who had IEPs or 504s and, and had a, a great special education department that really cared for the students, uh, so much can be done and has to be focused on being doing in our city because we have a, we have a lot of students in our city who have special needs. And, but the definition is very broad. And I think this is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. Any other discussion? Seeing no further discussion, um, the motion is on adoption of CR 2127. Mr. Hayworth, will you please call the roll? Mr. Chang. Hi. Ms. Wattenberg. Ms. Wattenberg. Hi. That would... Dr. O'Leary. Yes. Dr. Sutter. Yes. Ms. Thompson. Yes. Dr. Reed. Yes. Mr. Patterson. Yes. Mr. O'Sullivan. Aye. Ms. Lopez. Aye. Vice President Gasoy. Aye. The motion is unanimous. The uh, resolution is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Um, sorry. Um, our next ceremonial resolution recognizes Computer Science Week. Uh, this again goes to Representative Sutter. Would you like to make the motion? So moved. Great. Is there a second? Second. The motion being properly moved and seconded. Mr. Hayworth, will you please read the resolution? Thank you. State Board of Education Ceremonial Resolution Celebrating Computer Science Education Week, CR 21-28. Whereas Computer Science Week highlights the crucial role that computer science plays in transforming our society and propelling innovation. Whereas computing technology is an integral aspect of modern culture that is changing the landscape in which people communicate and interact. Whereas the field of computer science is a foundational science for the digital age and underpins the information technology sector of our economy, which serves as a significant contributor to the United States economic output. Whereas all students deserve a thorough preparation in computer science education, including access to the qualified teachers, technology, and age-appropriate curriculum needed to learn computer science at the elementary and secondary levels of education. Whereas the first Computer Science Week was launched by the Association of Computing Machinery on December 6th through 12th, 2008, in celebration of the birthday of computing pioneer Admiral Grace Murray Hopper. Whereas in July 2013, the theme of our of code was born and the initiative has inspired over 1 billion hours served with over 4,500 events around the world. Whereas the purpose of the annual computer science week is to inspire K through 12 students to learn computer science, advocate for equity and celebrate the contribution of students, teachers and partners to the field. Whereas computer science week not only strives to inspire students and their families to learn computer science, but advocates providing students the chance to participate in high quality computer science activities to expose them to the rich opportunities the field offers. Whereas the 2021 theme for Computer Science Week is CS is Everywhere, which explores the ways in which computer science is integrated into many facets of our lives and how we are continuing to continuously discovering new uses for it every week, or excuse me, every day. Whereas this year, the Computer Science Week was held December 6th through 12th, which entailed a kickoff and focus events on the following topics, identities and belonging in computer science, poem art hour of code, build your own computer science advocate, computer science district teams in action and voices from the field, computer science teacher association, computer science across the curriculum summit, 
And whereas the District of Columbia is participating in Computer Science Education Week and computer science focused middle and high schools like Digital Pioneers Academy, Public Charter Schools, uh, Friendship Technology Preparatory High School Academy, McKinley Techn Technology High School, Howard University Middle School of Mathematics and Science are harnessing the power of technology and providing students the opportunities to develop skills in science, technology, engineering, and math through robotics, engineering classes, and hands-on science curriculum. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the DC State Board of Education recognizes Computer Science Education Week and the impact that computer science is making everywhere and the relationship that computer science has to different subjects, industries, career paths, and our everyday lives. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Is there discussion? Dr. Sutter. Sorry, I was trying to get my hand up there and wasn't sure it was happening. Um, thank you, Mr. Hayworth, for reading that wonderful resolution that our staff put together with all the details about Computer Science Education Week. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, we have several schools in DC that have a focus on computer science education, but it really is a language that we want more of our students to be learning. When you look at the field of computer science, there are still far too, women and, uh, far too few women and people of color represented in the field. Uh, and I think it's an incredible opportunity for the students in our city to be exposed to computer science education, uh, which is the basis of so much of what we enjoy and work with every day. Literally the machines we're sitting on today, the software we're using to convene today, the software that folks are allowed to call in and participate, all of this is the product of computer science education. So thank you to my colleagues for recognizing this week. Uh, and I certainly hope we can continue to support this kind of education for all of our students across the district. Thank you for that. Dr. Sutter, is there uh, other folks who want to speak to this? Seeing no further discussion, um, Mr. Hayworth, uh, will you call the roll? Mr. Chang. Uh, yes. Ms. Wattenberg. Um, yeah. Dr. O'Leary. Yes. Dr. Sutter. Yes. Ms. Thompson. Yes. Dr. Reed. Yes. Mr. Patterson. Yes. Mr. O'Sullivan. Aye. Ms. Lopez. Aye. Vice President Gasoy. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Um, our next ceremonial resolution recognizes the winner of the Turkey Bowl, the Rough Riders of Roosevelt High School in Ward 4. Mr. Stevens from Roosevelt is joining us tonight. Is he here? Um, for consideration of the resolution, um, is Mr. Stevens in the waiting room, Mr. Hayworth? He is on the phone, um, I believe. Oh, okay. I'm here. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We know it's late uh, and we really appreciate you. Um, Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. O'Leary, would you like to make the motion? Uh, yes, I'd like to make the motion. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Oh, Thank, mute you. Thank you for the two seconds. Um, the motion being properly moved and seconded. Mr. Hayworth, please read the resolution. State Board of Education ceremonial resolution recognizing the 2021 Roosevelt High School football team, CR 21-29. Whereas the District of Columbia Interscholastic Athletic Association provides and supports a comprehensive athletic program for all DC public school students in grades four through 12. Whereas on November 25th, 2021, the Rough Riders of Roosevelt High School's football team claimed victory over the HD Woodson High School Warriors 37 to 22 at the 51st annual Turkey Bowl. Whereas the 2020, 2020 Turkey Bowl was canceled due to the pandemic to ensure the safety of all student athletes. Whereas the Rough Riders last Turkey Bowl win title was in 1979, which also marked their first Turkey Bowl victory over HD Woodson High School. And whereas Roosevelt High School's Rough Riders have exemplified the qualities of excellent student athletes and have brought praise to their community through the hard work and accomplishments. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the DC State Board of Education recognizes and congratulates the dedication and hard work of the student athletes and coaches of Roosevelt High School 
on the occasion of their 2021 DCI AA championship victory. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Is there a discussion? Uh, I, I have a discussion. Great. Uh, why don't you kick us off, Dr. O'Leary? I, I, I was coaching football when Roosevelt last won the Turkey Bowl in 1979. Uh, we, we didn't play them for the championship. This was a fabulous victory for Roosevelt, who, if you don't know, uh, the, the league is uh, separated by a Stars division and a Stripes division. And it's, it's good for that because the teams uh, aren't quite all at the same level. And Roosevelt moved from the Stripes division to the Stars division. And several years after that, they won the championship this year. So it was a fabulous victory for the Rough Riders. Uh, and it was wonderful for the community. Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. Uh, Representative Thompson. Uh, I'd just like to note that I'll be happy to vote for this resolution after I flagged it for Frazier, uh, despite the fact that it was included in the resolution that it was over H.D. Woodson High School. I think that might be an unnecessary detail, um, but you know, every dog has his day. Well, like <laughs> Alex says, Alex says that there's a, a winner and a loser. And H.D. Woodson has won many titles. Yeah, we're winners. Okay, <laughs> thank you, uh, Representative Thompson. Uh, is there further discussion? Not seeing further discussion. Uh, Mr. Hayworth, will you please call the roll? Mr. Che. Aye. Ms. Wattenberg. Yeah. Dr. O'Leary. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sutter. Yes. Ms. Thompson. Yes, Kim and I vote yes. Dr. Reed. Congratulations and yes. Mr. Patterson. Yes. Mr. O'Sullivan. Yes. Ms. Lopez. Aye. President Parker. I don't believe he's here. Oh, he had rejoined for a second, but he must have gone again. Um, so Vice President Gasoy. Yes. The uh, motion is uh, uh, unanimously approved and congratulations from another Ward 4 person who lives down the street. Way to go, Rough Riders. <laughs> Thank you. And congratulations again, Mr. Stevens. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, our next ceremonial resolution recognizes the winner of the Turkey Bowl, the Lions of Arch Archbishop Carroll High School in Ward 5. Representatives from Archbishop Carroll have joined us tonight for the consideration of the ceremonial resolution. Um, uh, Emily, it's not, it's not the Turkey Bowl. It's the uh, city championship. Okay, so this is a, I was wondering why there was two. Okay, so my uh, mistake in the script. Um, thank you for the correction. Do we have our uh, representatives from Archbishop Carroll with us? Unfortunately, they were unable to make it. Okay. So, um, Representative Patterson, would you like to make the motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Uh, the motion being properly moved and seconded, Mr. Hayworth, will you please read the resolution? State Board of Education ceremonial resolution recognizing the 2021 Archbishop Carroll football team, CR 21-30, whereas the District of Columbia State Athletic Association oversees postseason high school sporting contests in DC and is made up of DC public schools from the District of Columbia Interscholastic Athletic Association, DC private schools from various conferences such as the Washington Catholic Athletic Con Conference, and the Mid-Atlantic Athletic Conference, as well as DC public charter schools. Whereas on De December 4th, 2021, the Archbishop Carroll Lions claimed victory over the Roosevelt High School Rough Riders, 35 to 27 at the DCSAA Championship at Cooper Field on the campus of Georgetown University. Whereas the Archbishop Carroll Lions enjoyed a 13 to one record this football season, a new record for them in the most single season wins and the best record in school history. 
whereas amongst the Archbishop Carroll Lions players, 35 have earned DCSAA honor roll certificates, six were National Honor Society members and inductees, 21 earned all conference honors, two were named WCAC Metro Division Co Defensive Players of the Year, and one was named WCAC Metro Division Co Offensive Player of the Year. And whereas the Archbishop Carroll Lions have exemplified the qualities of excellent student athletes and have brought praise to their community through their hard work and accomplishments. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the DC State Board of Education recognizes and congratulates the dedication and hard work on the field and in the classroom of the student athletes and coaches of Archbishop Carroll High School on the occasion of their 2021 DCSAA championship victory. And be it further resolved that the State Board congratulates Archbishop Carroll's um, Nichols Harbor for being named Gatorade's 2021-2022 DC Football Player of the Year, not only for his outstanding athletic excellence, but also his high standards of academic achievement and exemplary character demonstrated on and off the field. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Is there a discussion? See? I went to that one too, and it was really exciting. It was overtime. Uh, and it was a really well played game by both teams. And they Thanks. wound up, they wound up with no Roosevelt lost two games and Carol lost one game through the whole season. Thank you for that, Dr. O'Leary. Um, seeing no further discussion, Mr. Hayworth, uh, the motion is on adoption of CR 2130. Uh, will you please call the roll? Mr. Chang. Aye. Ms. Wattenberg? Uh, aye. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Dr. Sutter? Yes. Ms. Thompson? Yes. Dr. Reed? Yes. Mr. Patterson? Yes. Mr. O'Sullivan? Aye. Ms. Lopez? Aye. Dr. Gasoy? Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. Um, our next Ceremonial resolution recognizes the outstanding work of the Metropolitan Capital City Group. Representative Thompson, would you like to make the motion? I moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, the motion being properly moved and seconded. Mr. Hayworth, will you read the resolution? State Board of Education ceremonial resolution on recognizing the Metropolitan Capital City Group, CR 21-31. Whereas the Metropolitan Capital City Group is a nonprofit organization of diverse and strong career-oriented women whose mission is to strengthen the DC community in Ward 6, 7, and 8 in the areas of health, education, employment, recreation, and the arts and humanities. Whereas on November 13, 2021, the MCCG kicked off its first community service project, the grand opening of the Birdhouse Library at the Washington Tennis and Education Foundation Center, East Capitol Campus in Ward 7. Whereas the Birdhouse Library is registered with the Little Free Library, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that, provide, that promotes neighborhood book exchanges. Whereas the Birdhouse Library will house a weekly installment of books for children five to 18 years of age. Whereas the Birdhouse Library is designed to encourage the love of reading and make books readily and easily accessible to youth in Ward 7. Whereas the Metropolitan Capital City Group gifted over 100 residents and their children with books and emphasize the importance of education at the grand opening. And whereas the Metropolitan Capital City Group plans to install more libraries across wards six, seven, and eight in the coming months. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the DC State Board of Education thanks Phyllis Yates Magnall, president of the MCCG, and the Dream Team Committee members, which led and organized the creation of the Birdhouse Library. And be it finally resolved that the DC State Board of Education recognizes the Metropolitan Capital City Group for its important contributions to promoting a love of reading and education in the district. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Is there a discussion? Yes, uh, Representative Thompson. So I would just like uh, to note that uh, we are having a kind of um, influx of these little libraries in Ward 7. Um, and I'm thrilled about it. Uh, and I'm, you know, trying to incentivize this behavior uh, with as much carrots as I can. So uh, I appreciate <laughs> the board uh, recognizing uh, the group with this resolution uh, because, you know, we there are just little nice things uh, that are a really big deal uh, that we should provide uh, to all children. Uh, I also just want to thank Representative Patterson 
uh, for taking the time uh, to come over to Ward mm -hmm. 7 uh, and be part of that ribbon cutting with me uh, because I know uh, that that was a very busy day <laughs> for both of us. And we all make choices about how we spend our time and our resources. And so I appreciate the investment of this group. Um, and I appreciate my colleague also recognizing um, their contribution is, pos is positive. And I look forward to um, supporting this investment with more books from uh, Representative O'Leary's uh, library. Thank you, Representative uh, Thompson. I agree. The small, nice things are so important now more than ever. Um, is there more discussion? Yes, Representative Chang. I cannot chime in. Uh, this is exciting. And I just want to flag that um, First Book had done a study uh, several years ago and found that one in 200 families east of the river had, uh, with, uh, had an age-appropriate book at home. Um, and that number has changed drastically, of course, over the last several years with the Books, of Birth, Books from Birth program. And, um, but the research is, is still very clear that uh, having a literate rich environment, being exposed to words early on makes a tremendous difference in uh, literacy learning. And so very excited about this. And also want to flag that, that that alone does not solve the problem. It has to come with uh, the people that bring life to the books, whether that be the teachers, the school librarians, uh, the, the caregivers and siblings. And so um, very, very excited to see this uh, uh, and, and, and uh, hope that also uh, comes along with uh, the work that needs to go around it. Thank you, Representative Chang. Is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the motion is on adoption of CR 2131. Mr. Hayworth, will you please call the roll? Representative Chang. Aye. Representative Wattenberg. Aye. Representative O'Leary. Yes. Representative Sutter. Yes. Representative Thompson. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Patterson. Yes. Representative O'Sullivan. Representative O'Sullivan? Aye. Representative Lopez? Aye. Vice President Gasoy? Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. Um, next up is our annual report. I'm sorry, the annual report of the State Board. This annual report, the first full year during pandemic, the State Board has continued its outstanding public engagement brought forward a number of vital issues like safe passage and continued work to reshape our accountability system and revise outdated social studies standards. We have thrived during challenging circumstances. I want to particularly thank the staff and fellows of the State Board who have made this possible. Alex, Darren, Caitlin, Roma, Mal uh, Malayo, Eunice, uh, Fra Franco, Giselle, Jocelyn, Rachel, and John Paul, you have our great, great gratitude. Um, is there a motion? I will make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Thank you. The motion being properly moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hi. Um, I should raise my hand, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Reed, you're on. It's 1017. Um, just again, I was able to read over the draft and I know there's, we're trying to get it finalized, but thank you to the um, staff for definitely catching the variety of events that we've engaged in, um, collecting meaningful data um, and just showing how much the board engages with constituents on a regular basis. And not just engaging, but using that information to inform the decision-making. So thank you uh, to our uh, staff for definitely, or staff members of the State Board of Education um, for capturing a, a year in review. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Dr. Sutter. Thank you. I'll echo everything Dr. Reed just said, and I'll note that for a year where most of our life was on Zoom, um, it's really exciting to look at this and see the many different ways our staff was able to capture the work that took place, but also to acknowledge all the ways in which the board and its communities 
um, were able to make time and space to connect creatively, whether it was outdoor story time uh, and the great photos from all of those events organized around the city um, or other, uh, our Juneteenth event that we had together in person. It's really wonderful to see the, um, the many different ways that our staff was able to capture the detailed amount of work, but also the, the, the many ways in which that work took shape and form. So thank you to our staff for putting together truly a, a vibrant report um, of what the year looked like for all of us. Thank you, Dr. Sutter. Is there further discussion? Oh, sorry, uh, Dr. O'Leary, did you have your hand up? No, okay. I will just say um, that I never thought I would look forward to an end of year report before, but now this is my third one um, and I am really looking forward to it. The staff really does do a knockout job and reflection is important. You know, I, I like that they forced us to reflect. <laughs> We have to answer their questions and then we get to sort of see the a much fuller reflection um, of the work that we've been doing as, as Dr. Reed and Dr. Sutter mentioned. So, and, and it looks great. So I do just wanna give a big shout out to all the work that goes into that. And also a shout out to the members for all the work that's in there. Um, that's sort of, that's commendable. Um, so it's a celebration. Um, seeing no further discussion, the motion is on adoption of the 2021 annual report of the state board. Mr. Hayworth, will you call the roll? Representative Wattenberg. Aye. Dr. O'Leary. Aye. Dr. Sutter. Aye. Dr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Patterson. Aye. Mr. O'Sullivan. Aye. Ms. Lopez. Aye. Vice President Gasoy. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. We are getting there. We have one more. Thank Our you. next vote will be set, sorry, we'll set the meeting schedule for 2022. The state board does its best to ensure that the public is made aware of upcoming meetings as early as possible. By setting our schedule now, we provide this courtesy for the entire calendar year. Once approved, the schedule will be posted in the DC register and, and on our website. Is there a motion to approve the 2022 schedule of meetings? So moved. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you. The motion being properly moved and seconded it is their discussion. Yes, Dr. Sutter. I just have one question. Um, on the document that is posted on Simply, all of the meetings are listed as virtual. Um, I know that we are still in the process of determining when and where we would be able to return to in-person meetings. So I just want to confirm that if we vote tonight on the schedule, um, that the location may still be subject to change. Is that an accurate statement? That's a great question. And I see that Mr. Hayworth, who is most qualified to answer that has his hand raised. So Mr. Hayworth. Thank you, Vice President Gasoy, And thank you for the question, Dr. Sutter. Yes, um, we are required to look to notice a uh, specific location. And so in the interim of of safety, we're trying to just put virtual since we don't know where we're going to be. Um, as members know, we do not currently have access to the old council chambers, and so we are still looking for other locations. And we'll update the public if if our, our meetings can be in person. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Great. Um, is there further uh, further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, um, Mr. Hayworth, will you please call the roll? Representative Wattenberg. Aye. Dr. O'Leary. Yes. Representative Sutter. Yes. Representative Thompson. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Patterson. Yes. Representative O'Sullivan. Aye. Representative Lopez. Aye. Vice President Gasoy. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. And I am sorry, this is our final promise. <laughs> our final vote this evening will revisit a resolution from March 2021. SR 21-2 established new committees to assist the State Board 
in its work. One of the ad hoc committees board governance chaired by Representative Thompson is set to sunset at the end of this calendar year. This work is not complete. So the committee has requested that we remove the sunset clause. Representative Thompson, would you like to make the motion? I'll move. Is there a second? Second. The motion being properly moved and seconded, is there discussion? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Representative O'Sullivan. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm a little lost. What is the sunset clause? So um, when we vote, do you wanna speak to this? Uh, okay, go ahead, um, Representative Thompson, and then. Producer John Paul and I are going to say the same thing, uh, or Mr. Hayworth and I are going to say the same thing. So initially, when we established this committee, uh, it was a ad hoc committee with an end date of uh, December of this year. And so in order for the board governance committee to continue its work, uh, we have to vote to remove the sunset clause, which means the committee sunsets at uh, the end of December. Uh, and I guess I should say one of the major reasons uh, that we want to continue the work is to allow enough time for uh, just adequate engagement around ideas. Uh, something that's been really important uh, to this committee's work in particular, uh, which could uh, shift a lot of different moving parts uh, is to make sure that in addition to, listen to listening to people once and what we think they said, going back to them and saying, hey, did we hear this correctly? Uh, and so we need more time uh, to do that. Uh, so I hope that answers your question and gives a little context as to the why. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question, Representative O'Sullivan and for the response. Representative Thompson, is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the motion is on removal of the sunset provision reading no later than December 31st, 2021 from, the, from SR 21-2. Mr. Hayworth, will you call the roll? Representative Wattenberg. Representative Wattenberg. Sorry, I. Representative O'Leary. Yes. Representative Sutter. Yes. Representative Thompson. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Patterson. Yes. Representative O'Sullivan. Aye. Representative Lopez. Aye. Representative Gasoy. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. Um, and we have arrived um, at new business. Um, so is there a new business? Yes, uh, Representative uh, O'Leary. I just sent uh, an invitation to all of the members uh, for our 21st AP reunion tomorrow night on Zoom from 6 o'clock to 7.30 where you can come and uh, see our Cadozo graduates uh, talk about what life has been like after AP. Um, so so I, the, you, you all got the invite just now and we'd love to have you. Um, could just stop by, you don't have to stay for the whole time, but to see uh, people who graduated from Cadozo 25 years ago, talk about what, what life is like. Um, and last year. Um, and also, um, I've just emptied the um, back porch in the living room of books. Uh, Carlene got the last books from uh, our donations. So I put something out on the listserv and I've already gotten about nine different people saying they want to donate books. So I've still, I've got books. I'll have books, I guess. Uh, and I'm still available to bring them to you or pick them up or whatever. If you've got some books, some of you have promised me books, <clears throat> but you haven't quite <clears throat> gotten them to me yet. Thank you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. Merry Christmas. Is there other new business? Um, Representative Lopez. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to raise a bit of awareness to our matters of safety in schools, because today I know that they were saying that my school was under a threat um, because supposedly someone claimed to um, want to come to the school armed. 
and they couldn't identify the person because they the threat was made through social media, through the multiple accounts that have been made by students uh, of you know taking a picture of someone being sleeping at school or making some sort of confessions, which are just rumors being made through social media about other people. Um, but it, it seems like things started all fun and games to whoever started all of these social media accounts. But now it's turning into something where they're starting to play with all of the staff and students in the building safety, where now you're, you know, one of the students in my class has had to leave in the middle of class because she genuinely did not feel safe staying in the school. And she called her parents, they picked her up and, and she left. Um, and I think we need to continue to make sure that everyone is safe in, in their school buildings. Um, because it's concerning to see that, you know, we were just talking about safe passage, but um, it's not only safe passage anymore, it's safety within school buildings. Um, and oftentimes things that happen out of the school building are brought into the school building. And that's where issues start to, you know, raise even more and, and, and uh, get created. And I just thought I'd share that with um, the rest of the representatives today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lopez. Um, and yeah, I would I would like to hear more about that. I didn't know about that today. So, um, is there other new business? Yes, Mr. I Hayward. did. I did find out that uh, Whittier, uh, through DCPS's uh, phone call, Whittier has been uh, gone virtual uh, until after the new year because of <clears throat> because of some uh, positive COVID. Um, happenings in the building. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Hayworth. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, I know it's a little unusual for me to address the board at the new business, but I did want to bring up um, that this is actually the last meeting as well, uh, in addition to Representative O'Sullivan. It is also the last meeting for our policy fellow, uh, Eunice. Um, she will be departing the state board at the, at the end of the week. Um, so if you have uh, want to say goodbye and thank you for all of her work uh, as well. She has been an outstanding um, part of the State Board Policies team through this virtual environment and, and we're deeply grateful for her. Thank you and thank right. you Eunice. And th sorry for mispronouncing your name. I had a teaching partner named Eunice and I always pronounce it that way, but thank you Eunice. And I do just wanna take this moment to thank Representative O'Sullivan. Thank you for both our student representatives for sticking it out until 1035 on a school night. Uh, we appreciate you. I know you stay up. Uh, but also just, um, you know, we're going to miss you a lot. <laughs> Representative O'Sullivan, you have been just an invaluable source of wisdom and knowledge. And um, I don't even want to think about it, you know, that you're not going to be back, but you are coming back in January. So because we have to celebrate you more. So I'm glad about that. Um, and I just want to thank you for for everything that you have brought to the state board. It's really invaluable. Thank you so much. Those words mean a lot to me. And, you know, I, I enjoy staying up this late and the way things have gone with college applications recently. You know, I was going to I'll be up for a couple more hours. I'm sure. Yep. And we want to hear what's, you know, going on. So remember to keep us in the loop as you go forward. I will. I'd like Sorry, to make a motion that we adjourn. Oh, hold on. Sorry, uh, Representative Thompson. No, I, I just had a question. I, did, I know we're going to, it sounds like we're going to celebrate Representative O'Sullivan uh, in January, but I didn't know if he had anything he wanted to say this evening. Um, I mean, that would be the only reason to belabor this meeting at this point. <laughs> it's the only reason? Yes. That's the only worthy reason, yes. Mm -hmm. I'll, 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 leave those, I'll leave those comments for, for the January meeting so we can all, uh, some of us can go to sleep. Thank you. I appreciate that. As usual, the wisest in the room. All right. Um, so, sorry. 
I'd like to re-motion an adjournment. Thank you for that. Is there a second? Second. Um, all right. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Uh, all those, oh, the ayes have it. Uh, and this virtual public meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is adjourned at 10.33 p.m. Good. Have a great That's night, y'all. It was great seeing you. Um, good meeting. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night everybody.